Welcome to another episode of the Stronger by Science podcast. Greg starts off today's episode with some very impressive feats of strength, and then we have a huge research roundup segment. In this segment, we talk about some recent research comparing different types of whey protein. Greg takes a deep dive into the research on phototherapy. We talk about glycogen depletion and replenishment, the use of coffee as a pre-workout supplement, some recent research on lower back pain, and more. To finish off the episode, we have an interview with Ben Pollock, and we talk first about power building, which is basically how to train for powerlifting and bodybuilding simultaneously, and we also talk to Ben about the subject of his PhD, which is the history of physical culture. If you'd like to support the podcast by subscribing to our monthly research review called Mass, this is a reminder that the Mass Black Friday sale is currently happening. Right now, you can get 30% off of all subscriptions with a large percentage of our profits going to this year's charity of choice, which is the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. That sale is happening right now, and it ends December 2nd. As always, thanks for listening, and enjoy the show. Welcome back to another episode of the Stronger by Science podcast. Today, I'm joined by a special temporary guest host named Greg Knuckles. Thanks for inviting me on. Thank you for accepting my invitation. I tell you what, Greg, we've got a lot to get to today, so I'm going to suggest that we dive right into feats of strength. Yes, sir. So uh, I have four things picked out for today. Going to lead with the one that probably everyone is expecting, and that is this feats of strength segment. Uh, I feel like we should just rename it the Julius Maddox update segment uh, because I feel like that's what we do a lot. But uh, he recently competed again. Um, In the lead up to this meet, he benched 700 for a triple, paused. Um, So everyone was expecting big things coming in. He ended up breaking his own all-time world record. He bench pressed 744 pounds, which is 337 and a half kilos. That beat his old world record by two kilos, uh, was... 335 and a half or 739. Um, and it, it was good to see this because as we talked about with the prior record, the press was smooth, looked like one of the spotters hit the bar. So after he got the rack command, he just kind of like dropped the bar on his chest. It was not a good looking scene. Uh, I don't think any of that was his fault, but you know, this new world record is absolutely faultless. It is a picture perfect bench press. Um, It's also worth noting he got it on his second attempt. Uh, The word I heard is that he was looking for 350 kilos or 771 on his third, Uh, but he felt some pec tightness after his second, so he just decided to, you know, shut it down after breaking his own world record rather than risk injury. Um, So I, I didn't see this lift Based on how it looked, does 770, does that look like it's like on the table? I mean, it's hard to tell um, because he's one of those types of guys who either gets it smoothly or misses. Right. Um, Comparing the 744 he did to the third rep of his 700 for a triple, the 744 looked easier than that third rep. So I do still think he had something left in the tank, but just watching his lifts it's hard to tell whether he has 10 pounds in the tank or 40 so i don't know i i'd probably give it a coin flip yeah i mean but we know what it's like you're you got 700 on the bar you're hitting that third rep it'll sneak up on you you know (laughs) in theory sure yeah um so that happened it's awesome uh he is pushing bench press into frontiers that no one else has um still making reasonably consistent progress. So, you know, is he going to break 800 before anyone else even breaks 750? Who knows? I wouldn't be shocked. Um, So moving on, Kaylor Woolham recently tied the deadlift world record in the 110 kilo class or 242 pound class. Uh, He pulled 432 and a half kilos or 953 pounds. That ties Christoph Wierbicki. Um, He had previously pulled that same amount, but he did it in a deadlift-only meet, whereas Kaylor Woolham did it at the end of a three-lift meet, which, you know, tends to take something out of people. Um, So ties the world record, but in my book is slightly more impressive. 
there was a bit of controversy about this lift. Um, so it looks like he kind of like double clutched the start a little bit. Um, and so in the rule book, if the plates break off the ground, uh, that is your attempt. And it's just a question of whether you lock it out or not. It kind of looks like the plates may have barely broken off the ground, then touched the ground again, and then broke the ground again to lock out. So kind of like as he was tensioning himself, he maybe put a little bit too much mustard into it. My take on that is I don't give a shit. Uh, <laughs> double clutching the start of a deadlift doesn't make the lift easier, folks. Uh, so, I mean, personally, I like strength sports because I like seeing strong people do strong things. And so, like, that's a rule. We're like, whatever. It's a rule. I don't care about the rules. Uh, or, like, this one specifically. Because this isn't... It doesn't make the lift easier. You know, it's not like he hitched it. Even though I think hitching's dumb as well. But that that's another conversation for another day. But it's not even like he did something that made made it easier. Like, he pulled it. To my eye, it actually looked like a cleaner lift than Weir Bickies. Um, I didn't think Weir Bickies was locked out. But that's also more controversy. This is a very controversial deadlift record all around. But anyway, he pulled it. He locked it out. Um, and... I personally am impressed. That's going to be, if you ever run for political office, the attack ad is going to be Greg Knuckles saying, I don't care about the rules. <laughs> <laughs> it's going right into the uh, the audio bank. Oh, man. Uh, that's probably true. Okay. Um, so moving on once more, uh, Jackson Powell, if you haven't heard that name, there's a good reason for it. He is 17 years old and... Uh, I don't know if he's ever competed. I think he has, but, you know, not like prolifically. Um, so if you don't know the name, learn the name. Uh, posted a training lift of himself squatting 800 pounds, which is 363 kilos. Um, high bar too, which was interesting. Um, so fun fact, uh, not that many 17-year-olds squat 800. So the world record for... Any 17-year-old is uh, Joseph Pena. He squatted 336 and a half or 800, 806 pounds when he was 17. Um, so this is the second heaviest squat by a 17-year-old ever caught on video, as far as I'm aware. Uh, but the noteworthy thing about it is, in addition to Jackson Powell and Joseph Pena, I think only one other 17-year-old has ever squatted over 700 <laughs> And so, you know, they're just kind of over there in, in outlier freak territory. Um, but yeah, strong kid. And I strongly assume he is going to keep getting stronger. Uh, so very impressive stuff from him. And then finally, uh, I think this is our first feat of strength that is actually a failed lift. Um, but it is impressive enough to me that I think it's worth including Ivan Makarov, who is a strongman from somewhere in Eastern Europe, uh, posted a video of a very close miss uh, in a training lift, deadlifting 501 kilos or 1,104 pounds. Eddie Hall famously has the strongman deadlift record at 500 kilos. Um, Makarov seems to be making a pretty hard run at that record. And it's, um, so you, you should go find the video because it's interesting. Uh, he, he gets it above his knee pretty fast and pretty smooth. And then, um, he, uh, like, I don't know, just fails very quickly. And, it was interesting to see because like he competes in strongman and strongmen can ramp, they can hitch. Like those are things that are perfectly allowed in strongman. And so generally if you see a strongman get a lift above their knees, they're going to lock it out because they just have more tools in their arsenal to be able to do so. He posted in the Instagram caption, like for this video that uh, he tightened his suit too much. So he couldn't get a good breath. So it's possible that he like failed very suddenly because he started blacking out. Like he sat the bar down very quickly and like instantly went to a knee. 
So, you know, maybe he, he had the strength for it, but was just blacking out. Not totally sure. Um, but more recently, he posted a video, a video of himself doing block pulls from below knee height with 540 kilos, which is uh, uh, 1,190 pounds, like almost 1,200 pounds. So, I mean, it seems like he has the lockout strength to lock out a mere 1,100. Um, so, you know, he didn't get the lift, but it was a damn close attempt. And uh, Eddie Hall's record doesn't look as safe as I thought it was, and certainly is as safe as Eddie seemed to think it was. Um, but yeah, we we very well may be seeing the next 500 kilo deadlifter soon, which is exciting. Definitely, I'm I'm still just I can't get over the fact that uh, Julius Maddox appears to be in his like. 14th consecutive year of noob gains yeah <laughs> like it's just linear progress on top of progress dude it, it's wild um he he was kind of stalled there for like two years or so um kind of consistently hitting numbers between about 650 and 700 and just the last two years it seems like his training has really started clicking i don't know when he linked up with um with josh bryant I know that's his current coach. You know, maybe he had like stalled and then that's when he went and started getting coaching by Josh and that's, you know, what really kicked things into overdrive. But man, the the last two years from him have been crazy. Um, he, he's, he has talked about being the first person to bench 800. And I'll tell you what, man, I believe it. I mean, I have no reason to disbelieve it with uh, <laughs> recent history. Okay, so um, let's move on to the next segment. We, we've gotten a lot of good feedback in the past when we do research roundup segments. So it's kind of, uh, you know, we do some more in-depth research reviews where we look at one paper and get really granular with the detail. But the research roundup segment's a little different because we do uh, kind of like a highlight reel. You know, we, we talk enough about the study to really get some good conclusions, and then we move on to the next one. So we've got a nice research roundup, uh, and one of the reasons we wanted to do it is because many of the listeners probably know Greg and I publish a monthly research review called Mass with our good friends Dr. Mike Zordo, Dr. Eric Helms. Did I say Zordo? I think you did. <laughs> Dr. Mike Zordos, Dr. Eric Helms. And uh, one of the hardest parts of mass every month is Greg goes through and does a journal sweep and we get all these potential articles to review and trying to narrow it down to like two or three to choose that month is so difficult. So we end up with this huge list of studies that we're interested in, but don't have the bandwidth to do a full write up of. And so a, a lot of the studies we're going to talk about here are basically studies that nearly made their way into mass, but didn't. You look like you're about to say something. Oh, I was going to say that might be your experience. Like, so in in terms of the total amount of nutrition versus training studies that get published, I think there's a somewhat comparable amount, at least in terms of like sports nutrition stuff. Uh, obviously, there's a ton of like clinical nutrition research that gets published as well. But uh, my experience is very much the opposite. Um <laughs> There, there's like every month there's probably another, I would say solid four or five studies where it's like, man, I, I wish, uh, I wish Trex or Helms could have tackled that one. I feel like, uh, between me and Mike, we review five studies every month. And I think like more often than not, there's four that are really good. And then it's just kind of like, who gets the fifth? And how can we try to make it sound like it's cool? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, my experience is very different. I feel like uh, I don't want to speak for Helms, but with all the stuff coming out in the sport nutrition world, it, there, it's just such a moving target. There are yeah. so many different topics to to investigate. And like, man, this month we talked about, uh, you know, sucralose and its effects on the gut microbiome. And I'm like, yeah, I tried to find all the studies on the human gut microbiome and uh, it's basically nothing. You know, there, there's still these new rocks that we're kind of turning over every single month. Um, but in any case, well, I, I, I think the I think the thing with training studies is like there are a lot of topics being investigated that sound cool, 
but it's kind of one of those things i mean you you read our stuff so you know this where it's like the topic sounds cool but then we actually get into the full text and we look at the design and we're like god damn it why did you do that right yeah Um, it's like so close and then you find something you're like i can't do anything with this yeah so i mean shameless pitch that's one of the value adds of mass like all of us have done research and have formal training in research design so like we we see a lot of things we see a lot of popular studies get shared around and then when we pull them up to look at them it's like ooh, there's some pretty major design issues in this study that we haven't seen literally anyone talk about i mean i think part of that is we know a fair amount about research design i think a larger part of that is like <laughs> Most of the people who talk about research on social media don't bother to ever read the full text in the first place. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's that's one of the things we do for you. Like, not just talk about what the research found, but whether it was adequately designed to draw the conclusions that it is attempting to draw. Definitely. So I'm going to dive right in. I've, I've got a study picked out here. It's by Castro et al. And it is, uh, it's called Comparative Meta-Analysis of the effect of concentrated, hydrolyzed, and isolated whey protein supplementation on body composition of physical activity practitioners. So basically what they're looking at, it's a meta-analysis looking at different forms of whey protein, uh, looking at how it affects uh, body composition in in people that are undergoing physical activity. So a meta-analysis, we've talked about them before, basically you're just searching the literature systematically and trying to combine the results of, of several studies that are similar in terms of their design and their research questions so that you can summarize the overall findings uh, in that body of literature. So um, the reason I wanted to talk about this study, like you mentioned, it's one of those things where I looked through the abstract and some of the findings, I was like, wow, that's really uh, surprising, if not counterintuitive. And then digging through the results, it, it makes a lot more sense when you get into the full text and you say, oh, okay, I, I see what's going on. Um, and with a meta-analysis, that's really not... Uh, meta-analysis, uh, assuming you do it reasonably correctly, is like, on the researcher side, it's like, what do you want me to do? I just told you <laughs> I was going to find this stuff and, and, and crunch the numbers. So it, it's no fault of the, the authors, uh, for sure. But um, let me get to the point here. So their search yielded eight studies with a total of 246 subjects uh, between them. And the average duration of these uh, protein interventions was 64.5 days. Now, the interesting findings related to, uh, to fat mass. And what they found was that overall, the whey protein supplementation interventions did yield a significant loss of fat mass. Where things got a little bit interesting was uh, when they looked at some of these subgroup analyses. So this is common in meta-analysis where you might say, okay, so we found 60 studies and we found this effect, but you know maybe 25 of them, of them were in women and the rest were in men. Did we maybe see different results in the you know female subgroup versus the male subgroup or something like that? So it, when there's a lot of studies, it makes a lot of sense. When there are fewer studies, it's a fairly limited approach you got to be a little bit careful uh with with how how uh aggressively you interpret the finding of that type of a subgroup analysis so what they did was they looked at some subgroups and uh, they looked at whey concentrate versus whey isolate and they found that uh, the reduction of fat mass was found in the whey concentrate studies but not in the whey isolate studies which uh, when you compare whey concentrate and isolate, it's a little bit counterintuitive. You wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't expect that to be the case. And so when you look a little bit closer at the result of that comparison, what you found was, the, uh, like I said, the whey isolate did not significantly reduce fat mass, but the, uh, the whey concentrate did. But the non-significant effect of whey isolate was actually bigger than the statistically significant effect of whey concentrate. So what really happened there um, was we, we basically had in the, uh, the whey concentrate group, very few studies. Um, it actually only had, uh, I think it only had three studies in it, but two of them reported 
very narrow confidence intervals. And so what that does in a meta-analysis is basically inflates the, it, it, I, I should put it the other way, it reduces the p-value uh, to a relatively extreme amount when you have extremely narrow confidence intervals for a particular study. It, it contributes, it pulls a little bit more weight of the analysis, so to speak. And so basically what happened was uh, when we looked at the overall mean change in fat mass for concentrate or isolate, the effects were basically the same. And in fact, the, the mean change for whey isolate was bigger than, than it was for concentrate. But because the way concentrate had these very narrow standard deviations for two of those three studies, it was statistically significant and the other was not. Uh, but when you look at that, um, it's really important with a meta-analysis not just to look at the p-values, but you got to look at the actual size of the effect. And so it's one of those weird things where you know, if I told you two different groups did a bench press intervention, one group increased their bench by 30 pounds, the other one increased their bench by 25 but the 25 was significant and the 30 wasn't. There's no way you would look at that intuitively and say, ooh, give me the one that increases it by 25. Yeah. Right? The other group got better by more. It was just because there was a little more variability, uh, it, wasn't, it didn't cross that magical threshold of being statistically significant. Yeah, I mean, so d depending on like the difference in variability, it, it could influence what you were doing. So, you know, l let's just say theoretically... It's 30, 30 pounds plus or minus 30 pounds and 25 pounds plus or minus five pounds. If you're, say, a strength coach for a high school football team and you really want to make sure that the vast majority of your athletes improve over summer workouts, you very well may go with the 25 plus or minus five versus 30 plus or minus 30. So, you know, and I guess that kind of depends on philosophy like if you really just want to grow a handful of freaks uh and you don't really care if a fair amount of other people crash and burn you go with the 30 plus or minus 30 so it, it, in situate and that's a purely theoretical situation i don't know if i've ever seen a paper that actually had results like that but theoretically if there's huge differences in variance that could actually be meaningful if like the consistency of the effect does matter quite a bit more to you than the actual magnitude of it but in virtually every situation like like this one where you do see something like that where the thing that has the larger effect size isn't significant but the other thing is it's generally like not actually that meaningful of a difference in variance it was just like you know, slight differences and one is a p-value of 0.04 and the other one's 0.06. And because people just fucking turn their brains off when they read statistics, they're like, oh, yep, one of them matters and the other doesn't. Yeah, and I, I completely agree with you, but I would also add a layer to that. When you're talking about meta-analysis, you also have to keep in mind that some of the things contributing to that variability might just be design differences population differences or the way the outcome was measured mm -hmm. and so in some cases you might find it's not that the effect was more significant or, or um, more consistent in this subgroup it's that they used a more consistent measurement tool yeah or yeah. they sampled a population that happens to be more consistent than the other or if it's a random effects model you just have simply more studies in there like that's going to increase power and decrease the the variance of your pooled effect estimate yeah, so so meta analyses have become the thing that really get me excited these days. I don't know why. I just seem to be gravitated toward them because I think I think they lend themselves to misinterpretation misinter pretty frequently. Um, but anyway, what I was getting at with this particular study, it was one of those things where that finding jumps out at you, and then you look at the full text, and you're like, oh, okay, these were a ba they were basically the same. Like the magnitude of change was pretty much the same. One of them just had slightly tighter standard deviations. But at the end of the day, way concentrate, way isolate, it's the same thing, basically. So, so that was one of those things where you look into it a little deeper and you go, oh, never mind. Um, same kind of thing. They, they found with their subgroup analysis that when the whey protein, or I'm sorry, when the protein content of the supplement was between 51% and 80% by weight, um, they, they found a significant effect, but not when it was over 80% by weight. And that is pretty counterintuitive because you'd think if the whole purpose was to look into this protein supplementation, more protein would be 
better, if not as good, you know, than a lower percentage protein uh, product. And so that was another one that caught my eye. Um, I think what was happening there, sometimes what you'll see is you, you can get a little bit of artifact in these meta analyses. So if a subgroup only has maybe two or three studies in it, every now and then they just happen to be the two or three studies that were most or least impressive in terms of the magnitude of effect. It's kind of just a game of chance at that point. Um, and so with, with that, it's, you know, if, if you told me that you had 16 studies in each subgroup and the lower percentage protein product outperformed the higher percentage one, then I'd say you got something. But when we're talking about looking at such a small number of studies and trying to find the mean of these very small groups, one study that's, uh, particularly uh, impressive with its refining with with its findings or particularly uh, modest in terms of the effect size that can completely throw your average and all of a sudden that subgroup analysis is a little bit skewed again no fault in the researchers that's the way it goes sometimes um, but it's like one of those things when, when you're talking about literally having two or three studies in a subgroup it's like pull a coin out of your pocket and, and flip it four times if you get heads three of those four times you're not going to say whoa this is a special coin, right? Like <laughs> yeah. when you have really small samples or a really small number of studies, every now and then we see little tiny patterns emerge that are not patterns. They're just artifacts, mm -hmm. you know? So um, another thing that they found was uh, they found that the effect on fat mass was significant for people uh, who were trained uh, rather than sedentary leading into the study. So like fairly active people rather than sedentary people at the time of enrollment. Um, but again, it was one of those things where one group, the change was significant, the other group it was not. But the mean difference in terms of fat mass for one group, it was a loss of 0.92 kilos. For the other group, it was a loss of 0.95. That is the same change, right? Like yeah. if, if we're going to get down to a, a couple tenths of a kilo as being the real distinguishing factor between working and not working, uh, yeah, those were the same number. The sedentary uh, subgroup only had two studies in it. There was no chance that was going to be significant. Dude, uh, d the more the more you tell me about this meta analysis, the more I feel like this should be like the poster child study for everyone who doesn't like frequentist statistics. <laughs> yeah, there's a little bit of that going on. Um, you know, it's tough. So. With these subgroup analyses, I think a lot of people do them because they're like, listen, this will be cool. We'll be able to, you know, explore some patterns in there. And I frankly, I'm kind of kind of guilty of this myself. I mean, I did a meta with very few studies and did some subgroup analyses. But in the paper, I begged people not to overinterpret them. And I said, by the way, I did a formal moderator test for all of these. None of them were significant. These are purely for forming hypotheses for future studies. Do not over... Like, I, I must have had probably six disclaimers begging people, <laughs> please don't misinterpret. So th that's that's the thing. If you're going to do this approach, it's not that you can't do it. Um, you just want to make sure that you interpret it uh, extremely cautiously and, and have a... Um, several disclaimers saying, this is purely so that whoever's going to run their next way isolate study hey, maybe you look at whether they were sedentary or trained or, you know, it's to form hypotheses to to help researchers move this body of literature forward. Um, so, yeah, th there are some dangers uh, with meta-analyses for sure, but but they're also a really powerful tool. So it, th there's a little bit of a, a lot of people have love-hate relationships with meta-analyses because they, they can be so informative, but they can also be misinterpreted uh, pretty egregiously sometimes. Um, now, when it comes to fat-free mass, there was no effect uh, in any of the scenarios that they investigated. And uh, that shouldn't be super surprising. Um, when it comes to the protein literature, I, I think it's, I think we've got enough of an understanding about what protein does and what it doesn't, that uh, it's safe to say that the effects of protein supplementation, particularly for, for fat-free mass or lean mass, are going to be entirely contextual. So um, you need to make sure that this intervention is changing total protein intake from less optimal to meaningly more optimal in terms of their overall protein intake. 
And the effect of that protein supplementation is going to depend on their training status. It's going to depend on their training stimulus, their overall diet. There are so many factors that come into play. So it's one of those things when you read a study and says, oh, whey protein didn't help with, with lean mass. They didn't just debunk whey protein. You just saw a study in which all those contextual factors weren't in place to actually really uh, highlight the potential benefit of a whey protein supplement. So so this is one of those studies, like I said, you look at it and you're like, oh, I kind of want to talk about this to make sure people aren't going to overinterpret some of these subgroup analyses and run with them and, and, and make conclusions that aren't accurate. Like, sorry, I only have proteins that are less than 80% protein by weight because I know they're better. It's like, no, they're like almost exactly the same. I'm honestly wondering where they got those proteins from in the first place. Because generally when you see isolates, it's like 90, 95% plus protein by weight. But I mean, even most concentrates are in the 80-ish range. Yeah, I don't know. It, it Maybe they were, um, maybe they had some carbohydrate in there. Maybe. That, that might be a way to do it. Yeah. You know, like uh, there's back in the day, uh, the NCAA said that you couldn't give protein supplements to athletes for, I assume, a reason. <laughs> I, I don't know what it would possibly be. But uh, so what they said was like, I think it was, I think the threshold was 30%. Mm-hmm. It was like at least no more than 30% of the calories can come from protein in the interest of safety or amateurism or, you know, insert whatever mad lib you want to put in there. And uh, I'm pretty sure they got rid of this rule. But so what they would do is they'd be like, here's the collegiate protein powder. And it was the same protein powder with like 60 grams of sugar added to it <laughs> to try to <laughs> to try to add enough calories that that the protein protein provided like 29.9 percent so uh so maybe there were some some carbohydrate uh contributions there dude so i I remember when i was first getting into lifting uh you know i was like 14 years old and a dumbass like i didn't know anything um and a big guy at the gym told me that oh man like if you want to get big if you want the best protein supplement on the market you got to go with muscle milk that's like the best thing. It has all this extra stuff in it. It's going to make you huge. So I remember going to the Muscle Milk website and looking to see what their products were. And they they did have like uh, just regular Muscle Milk and then a more expensive like Muscle Milk Pro. Mm-hmm. And it said on the label something like, uh, you know, preferred by NCAA, like the best NCAA football teams or whatever. Um, and I remember looking at the label and I was like, This is the same fucking product, but there's like less protein per serving, shit ton of maltodextrin. I'm 14. I don't know what that is, but whatever. It's not protein. Uh, And it's like 25% more expensive. Like, dude, you know, supplement companies fucking loved that rule because maltodextrin is so much cheaper than protein, but they just throw that in and then probably are able to make the product more expensive because they can say like used by ncaa athletes you know so yeah for sure so before we move on to the next study i've got my my two big uh take home points about meta analyses number one the beauty of a meta analysis is that it gives you a, a pooled effect size the magnitude of the effect is the beauty of the meta-analysis. Way too frequently, people get bogged down in the p-value. Most of them, the power is inflated just because you've got several studies in the mix anyway. Um, it, but but the thing is, like, especially with these subgroup analyses, it can go the other way, where it's like you only had two in the subgroup. It wasn't going to be significant unless the effect was enormous. So what I would encourage people to do when you're looking at a meta-analysis, look at the size of effect as the the most important thing you're looking at how consistent is it and then start worrying about the p-values and all that stuff okay but don't don't just get caught up in the p-value and forget to worry about how big the actual effect was because no one cares about a super tiny effect with a p-value of 0.04 it's not doing anything for you if the effect is small in the first place the other take-home point and this, this applies to meta-analyses, but also just about any study in our field where they measure two groups over time. If one group improves to a significant level and the other group improves, but in a non-significant level based on their p-values, 
that doesn't mean there was like an interaction. It doesn't mean that their responses were wildly divergent, right? So two groups could respond almost the same way. Maybe one group had a p-value of 0.04, the other had one of 0.06. Every now and then, that's a kind of a extreme example, but you'll see people who say, wow, this one treatment worked and the other one totally didn't. And with those p-values, their responses were essentially the same. So, so when that applies to subgroup analyses and a lot of other studies in this field as well, look for interaction tests, look for moderator tests. Those are what actually tell you if the responses were indeed divergent in nature. Yeah, and you still see that even in the published research show up all the time. Like, every month, every month. Yeah, I mean, so that's not just like, you know, social media not being good at interpreting research. No. That's, that's like very poor interpretations of research in the research. Yes, that, that gets by peer review every single month and will probably until we're dead, Greg. Sweet. Yep. All right, now, <laughs> Keep, Greg. Keeps us in a job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, previously, you had talked a little bit about phototherapy, um, and I believe you have an update for us about phototherapy. I do. So on the last uh, non-Q&A episode of the Stronger by Science podcast, I talked about phototherapy a little bit. Uh, when we recorded that episode, it was, I don't know, maybe like 36 hours after I found out how far behind this body of literature I was. And so to be clear, I can churn through a lot of literature in 36 hours, but you know, not even close to an entire body. And so... Uh, Within like 48 hours of recording that podcast, I was like, shit, I just learned a lot more stuff that I wish I would have included. Um, so this is just a really quick update. So just to recap from the last episode, we talked about phototherapy and the things I leaned into the most were that there is pretty solid and consistent evidence that phototherapy can improve acute performance um, it can improve force output. Um, I wasn't sure why last time I dug up some more papers. It turns out phototherapy increases intracellular calcium levels, um, which improves excitation contraction coupling a little bit. So that largely explains the increase in force output. So that's cool for strength athletes, but then it also just improves other training performance. Um, by essentially making oxidative metabolism a little bit more efficient by allowing oxygen to dissociate from hemoglobin and myoglobin a little bit more efficiently and helping a couple of the cytochrome complexes of the mitochondria uh, function a little bit more efficiently. So it increases stuff like rep performance or time to task failure during isometric tasks. Uh, really good stuff. Another thing that there's quite a bit of evidence supporting is that it improves recovery from resistance exercise. Um, so, you know, things like decrease in muscle soreness, lower levels of creatine kinase, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, and, and actual improvements in rate of performance recovery. So, you know, you do a fatiguing session, you test force output 48 hours later. If you had phototherapy done after the training session, force tends to have recovered a little bit more in the 24 to 48 hours following training. So that was the stuff that I had read up on the most prior to the last time I talked about this. And one thing I noted is that a lot of times things that improve recovery actually don't help longitudinal training outcomes. So they don't actually help you get bigger and stronger. And sometimes they actually go the opposite direction. So, you know, if you take a high dose of NSAIDs, uh, like non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs before a training session, you're probably not going to be as sore the next day or the day after, but uh, at least if you're young and healthy, it's probably going to compromise uh, strength and hypertrophy over time. There's some conflicting evidence with older adults, so older adults may actually get more hypertrophy if they take NSAIDs. Uh, that's another discussion for another day. Um, similar with high dose antioxidants may help improve recovery a little bit, but also compromise long-term training outcomes. Same thing with ice baths that improves, especially like functional recovery. So things like force and work capacity, but now we have like three or four studies showing that that decreases longitudinal training outcomes. So you can't just assume that something that improves recovery actually helps make you bigger and stronger over time. And so one of the things I noted is that I did find one study 
showing that phototherapy actually improved strength and hypertrophy outcomes over time. Um, but I, I was kind of more tentative about that because that was the only study looking at longitudinal outcomes that I had come across at that point. Because, you know, when we recorded last time, I'd, I'd mostly been reading about the acute stuff. So since then, I came across a review by Ferraresi et al., um, titled Photobiomodulation in Human Muscle Tissue, an Advantage in Sports Performance? Question mark. Uh, and within this review, um, they kind of collated and brought together all of the longitudinal studies that had been done to that point, looking at the effects of phototherapy on long-term training outcomes. So there were, um, there were seven in total. Three of them aren't all that relevant to us. So one of them was looking at whether doing phototherapy before or after a training session was better for long-term outcomes, and it was pretty similar. Um, but that, you know, it's not comparing phototherapy to not using phototherapy. One of them looked at uh, cycle ergometer training. So, you know, basically cycling training, which very well could be cool and useful to someone. I'm personally not all that interested, probably not super interesting to most listeners of this podcast. Uh, but I, I can just give you the cliff notes on that. It did improve, um, or it did decrease quadriceps fatigability during uh, an isokinetic knee extension test um, after cycle ergometer training using phototherapy. So, you know, that's potentially interesting for endurance athletes listening to this. Um, and then the other one that, again, is probably not all that relevant is one where the only functional outcome they were looking at was vertical jump performance. And the, uh, the longitudinal aspect of the study was two weeks of training. Uh, and I don't think you can really do anything with that. So those were three of the studies. There were four more, though, that were looking at longitudinal outcomes that probably are useful and interesting to the people listening to this. So the first one is the Baroni study I mentioned last time. So subjects in that were untrained males. They were doing eccentric knee extension training for eight weeks. Um, and basically phototherapy helped everything. So they looked at several um, muscle thickness measures that increased more in the phototherapy group, 15.4% versus 9.4%. They looked at isometric peak torque of the quads. Uh, that increased by 20.5% versus 13.7%, again, with the larger increase in the phototherapy group. And eccentric peak torque increased by more as well, so 32.2% versus 20%. Moving on, um, there was actually a really cool uh, twin study performed by the same person who who authored the review, Farah Resi. Uh, Title is Effects of Light-Emitting Diode Therapy on Muscle Hypertrophy, Gene Expression, Performance Damage, and Delayed Onset Muscle Soreness, colon, Case Control Study with a Pair of Identical Twins. So, as the title alludes to, the subjects were just a pair of identical twins. One of them, they both trained for 12 weeks, three times a week. Um, one of them had phototherapy performed on them uh, after each training session. The other did not. Uh, leg press increased in both of these individuals. Uh, so in, in all of these numbers I'm about to read, the larger increase is in the one that received phototherapy. So leg press increased 53% versus 28%. Uh, knee extension one rep max increased 37% versus 20%. Um, the one receiving phototherapy had lower uh, creatine kinase levels throughout the entire study. So that is, again, a, a marker of muscle damage. Uh, had lower measures of subjective muscle soreness throughout the study. And this one also assessed hypertrophy. They looked at thigh muscle volume, which increased by 20% in the one receiving phototherapy versus 5% in the one who didn't. Um, and they also looked at some gene expression stuff. So there were uh, larger reductions in uh, uh, gene expression for interleukin-1 beta and myostatin in the one receiving phototherapy. So interleukin-1 beta is an inflammatory marker. Myostatin is obviously a, an inhibitor of muscle hypertrophy. So those gene expression for both of those genes decreased um, 
more in the one receiving phototherapy, and there was a larger increase in mTOR gene expression in the twin receiving phototherapy. mTOR, again, is implicated in probably the main hypertrophy signaling cascade. Um, Dude, that's wild. 20% versus 5%. Yeah, and, and so, like, that's especially noteworthy because we can't say, like, oh, maybe it's just, like, sampling variability. They're, they're identical twins. Yeah, genetics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, for real. So one thing worth noting is, contrary to popular opinion, identical twins aren't actually genetically identical. Um, they were when, like they split in the womb, but people do actually accumulate not just epigenetic changes, but some degree of genetic changes over time just due to like gene damage and whatnot. You can have like new genes inserted by viruses. Um, and I think uh, monozygotic twins also have uh, differences in like copy number variation, even like when they do split. That, I didn't know that. That's interesting. Yeah, so so they're not perfectly identical, but you would still not, assume... Not a bad control, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you can still very safely assume that they're genetically similar enough that differences in genes aren't aren't explaining a fourfold difference in hypertrophy. You, you know how, like, one of the things we talk about sometimes is, like, the new trend is to just arbitrarily split your sample into responders and non-responders? Yeah. You know somewhere on a college campus, a couple twins signed up for a study. You know that at least one time in history, one was a responder and one wasn't. Oh, you know? for sure. Because it's always so arbitrary. I'm like, what are you actually splitting? Yeah. Okay. So uh, that was study number two. Number three, uh, title is Effects of Low-Level Laser Therapy, parentheses, 808 nanometers, close parentheses, on physical strength training in humans. Subject here, or subjects here were 36 untrained men. They trained leg press for 12 weeks, uh, received laser therapy at the end of each training session. Um, and so one rep max leg press increase, 55% in the phototherapy group versus 26% in the uh, non-phototherapy group. Um, they looked at uh, increase in isokinetic knee extension peak torque that increased by 7.38% in the phototherapy group versus 3.16% in the other group. Uh, they looked at thigh circumference. So I, I guess they didn't have, that's weird that they had a dynamometer, but not any way to like directly assess hypertrophy, but whatever. They looked at thigh circumference as a measure of hypertrophy, uh, pretty rough measure, but it is what it is. Increased by 4.52% in the phototherapy group versus 2.75% in the other group. Uh, one thing worth noting is that the difference in leg press 1 rep max in this study was statistically significant. The increase in isokinetic uh, torque and thigh circumference wasn't weren't significant. But I kind of think that's because they made some weird statistical choices here. Um, so they used a cruz cal wallace test rather than just like a uh, two by two ANOVA, um, which is weird because generally you would only use that test if the assumptions of ANOVA had been violated. Um, and they just said that they decided they were going to use that preemptively, which is a really weird thing to do because unless there is a good reason to not use an ANOVA, using a cruz call wallace test is just going to decrease statistical power so like yeah and it, it's not even like it's not even like a conservative safer option it's right like you're, you're losing detailed information from your data unnecessarily correct unless you needed to do it yeah it's not just a matter of like you know choosing a more conservative post hoc test right so that decision wasn't explained in the text uh, just kind of eyeballing some of these bar graphs, all they show is like pre and post values. They don't show like change and standard deviation of the change. So it's, so unless we assume that the vari the variability in the changes were super crazy, I kind of think that maybe isokinetic knee extension torque would have been a significant difference and maybe leg circumference wouldn't have been if they had done an ANOVA, but that's, just a kind of like minimally informed guess here. Anyway, weird stats. It is what it is. Um, 
But, you know, the significant difference, again, was in favor of phototherapy, and the two non-significant differences also leaned in favor of phototherapy in that study. And then the fourth one of this group is by Toma and colleagues. Title is Low-Level Laser Therapy Associated with a Strength Training Program on Muscle Performance in Elderly Women, colon, a randomized double-blind control study. This is probably the one that Stronger by Science listeners would care about the least just due to the population, because, you know, it's elderly women. Uh, we know statistically most of you people are uh, men under 40. Like, that's that's the fitness industry if you're a male content creator. <laughs> we, we have a lot of female listeners, but not a lot of elderly female listeners. No, so our audience is absolutely more diverse than just about everyone else I've talked to. Yeah. But, you know, more diverse means we're like 68% male instead of 85. Right, but it's yeah. But it's still like... Fairly skewed. Anyway. I, I just want to let all the ladies listening know that we appreciate them. Oh, we absolutely do. Um, but yeah, so I know that uh, a, a decent amount of the audience will care less about this study. However, I think this is a very important study from a scientific perspective because... If you have a treatment that only works in a very specific population, that tells you that, you know, maybe there is only, there's something like physiological, physiologically different about that population that makes it effective, but maybe it's not as generalizable. Um, but so when you have most of the studies on healthy young men, and then you have another study on elderly women, that is a very substantially different population. And so if you wind up seeing a similar effect in that population as well, that lets you know that, you know, whatever the treatment is doing is probably, you know, going to be more likely to apply to all humans versus just a specific population of humans. Uh, so very important study. So subjects were 48 elderly women. They did eight weeks of leg curls and knee extensions. Um, and so in this study as well, they looked at knee extension one rep max increased by 31.8% in the phototherapy group versus 21% in the other group. Uh, they also looked at several isokinetic variables. So um, in like a, a multi-rep test, they looked at total work performed, power, and peak torque. Um, this study also had weird stats. So it would have been a very ideal study to, you know, use uh, like two by two ANOVAs on, but or like two by six, I guess, since they had a bunch of different measures, whatever. Um, but instead, for, for all of the the various measures, they just did uh, two one-way ANOVAs instead of various two-way ANOVAs. Um, and so they just did like pre and post, and they looked to see whether the groups differed at pre and looked to see whether they differed at post, which... Again, like you're not going to be able to get an interaction effect there to see if like the actual changes were different. Um, so again, it's hard to tell, but there were graphs and just kind of eyeballing the graphs. Like certainly the the nominal values of isokinetic work power and peak torque increased more in the phototherapy group, but since they didn't actually do the appropriate statistical tests on like whether those increases were significantly larger. It's hard to say, but they were certainly nominally larger. You know, the thing that's most frustrating about that what? is uh, like, let's say you didn't want to do the two-way ANOVA because you didn't want to deal with the interaction and the theoretical underpinning that requires some degree of thought, right? They could have just done the one-way and COVA on the post and just use the pre-values as a covariate, the interpretation would be just as easy. And it's literally just the click of a button in most softwares. It's just so frustrating. And in fact, that actually it, that actually tends to outperform, outperform a two-by-two two ANOVA. Um, th there has been some uh, simulation studies where, mm -hmm. they, where they kind of simulate a bunch of data sets. The, uh, the one-way ANCOVA on post-tests using pre-tests as the covariate is in many cases better, but pretty much always at least as good as the two-way ANOVA for the four people out there that are interested in that. Well, I'll tell you what, that's not what they did. <laughs> that is not what they did. 
So, and, and by the way, I know I just said almost always for a stats decision. So just don't yell at me. I know you shouldn't oversimplify like that. I'm sure there are certain scenarios where I'm wrong. So don't yell at me. Well, of, of the six people who know what you're talking about, at least one of them is very upset right now. Pretty much. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, the one thing we can say for sure is the one rep max knee extension, uh, increased more in the phototherapy group. The other measures, again, increased nominally more in the phototherapy group, but hard to know if if those differences were significant. So anyway, um, those were the studies. In aggregate, if you look at the measures of either one rep maxes or like peak torque values, um, in seven measures across four studies, mean increase was 33.8% in the phototherapy conditions versus 18.4% in the other conditions. Um, which is almost a twofold difference, not too shabby, uh, and more than a twofold difference in hypertrophy, albeit in fewer measures. So three measures across three studies, uh, 13.3% versus 5.7%. So basically, I think I, un- I mean, I definitely undersold uh, the amount of longitudinal studies there were on phototherapy the last time I talked about this on the podcast. Um, it seems pretty solid. One thing worth noting is like four studies means a lot more than one study, and especially when it's four studies who all have broadly similar findings. Um you know, so it's it's a general finding that has now been replicated three times, which is pretty cool with no evidence against it. Um, so that's that's good. Uh, certainly, more studies would be very much appreciated because you know even four very consistent studies, it's still just four studies. Um, and the other thing worth noting is all of these studies used untrained lifters. Um, I have to assume that if you did these studies on trained lifters, certainly like the absolute amount of improvement in both groups would be lower. I kind of assume that the relative value that you get from phototherapy would be smaller as well. Um, just because like it, it seems to increase intracellular calcium. That's a good thing. Uh, and also like make oxidative metabolism work a little bit better. Those are things that also just change with resistance training. So it is possible that it wouldn't, I guess it's possible that it wouldn't do anything and certainly possible that the the magnitude of the effect would be smaller in trained lifters versus untrained. So like that's a, that's an important caveat to point out, but just based on the literature that we do have, it seems really promising, seems really effective. Uh, and just kind of reinforces what I said the last time. Like, it's surprising to me that no one's talking about it because, I mean, it it, it seems to improve all aspects of training. It improves performance in the gym. It improves recovery after training. And it helps you get bigger and stronger uh, over time. Like, I don't know, man. Like, I see a lot of people talking about trivial shit that, like, maybe affects one of those three things uh, to a much smaller degree. Just so do it. I, I know you want to take a swipe at beta alanine, so just do it. People still talk about beta alanine. <laughs> Why the fuck do people still talk about beta alanine? Like it, it doesn't do hardly anything for for performance, like in the durations that most resistance training takes place. And so, like, it fucking makes your skin crawl. Improves performance by like one point four percent or whatever the fuck it was in the last meta analysis, and like. People still talk about it like it's a good thing. Like, I don't know. Like, let's talk about phototherapy and just shut the fuck up about beta alanine. Let's just talk about lasers, you know? I hear you. No, it, it, it is surprising. I mean, I remember the first time on social media I saw somebody doing it. And I was like, oh boy, here we go again, right? I, I just immediately... Because it looks crazy. The, the the general idea. Yeah, I mean, I I never looked into it more because like I've known about this general premise for for a decade. Um, like a physical therapist that worked with one of the first guys I trained with. Like I met him, we chatted for a while. Um, he was like, "Oh, you should come down to the clinic at some." I was like dealing with a hamstring strain. He was like, "You should come down to the clinic. I can get that hamstring to heal up in half the time. I got this laser." 
It's going to get you right. <laughs> and like, even as like a fucking 16 year old kid, I was like, come the fuck on. Like, right. it's a laser. Like, you can't tell me that a laser is going to help my hamstring heal faster. Turns out it probably can. Like, there's a pretty large amount of rehab literature on uh, laser therapy as well. But I mean, when I heard about that, when I was a gullible child, I was like, this has to be <laughs> bullshit. So I think I just never looked into it more because my first impression was like, there's no way this is true. Yeah. But it seems like it is. The, the first time I saw it, it was the person who was doing it and kind of posting about it was somebody who does tend to be susceptible to the newest, just absolute bs on the market right so like just the newest <laughs> ridiculous supplement and just all the weird modalities that show up for six weeks and everybody's doing them and then you never hear about them again so i was like oh okay on to the next uh <laughs> on to the next one but no I, i've been stunned the more you know we've talked about this you and i've talked talked about this probably three times now and uh there's research that all, they call that science i guess yeah you know? like apparently it does stuff it's wild that's cool. I mean, I I still I still retain my skepticism of consumer grade products that I expressed the last time we talked about this on the podcast. But yeah, I, I mean, the more and more I read about the actual science of it, the more and more sold on it I am conceptually. Um, if anyone's listening to this and they're looking for a reasonably cheap but possibly impactful study to do, um. Do a validation study on a consumer grade uh, phototherapy product. Um, they range anywhere from about a hundred bucks to three hundred bucks. Uh, you know, you could probably rock that with a, a reasonably small grant. Like, and if it turns out that any of them work really well, man, I'm all in. Uh, in and I'll note, I gain nothing from saying any of this. I'm not. I'm not in the the pocket of big laser. Uh, I just think this is really cool, and I am stunned that I was this ignorant about it. Yeah, well, you weren't alone. Uh, nobody's talking about it. One thing that people do talk about is carbs. <laughs> That's a, a jarring segue. Silky smooth. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, there's a study. It was a, a meta-analysis, kind of, about um, glycogen replenishment. And uh, this was a study by Macklin et al. I had considered doing it for a mass issue, decided not to. And then somebody, uh, uh, Joshua Hockett, actually emailed me and was like, hey, have you seen this? You should, uh, you should write something about it. So um, I'll meet you halfway, Joshua. I'll talk about it. Um, so if you're thinking, okay, I don't really care about glycogen depletion, who would? It, it, there actually is some application for a lot of different people. So if you're a power lifter and you're cutting weight, uh, trying to make weight for a meet, there's a decent likelihood that you might be depleting uh, your muscle glycogen and might need to replenish it in a fairly tight turnaround. Um, if you're any kind of sport athlete, uh, certainly doing uh, vigorous amounts of exercise, high volumes of it during your competitive season, you, you might need to make sure you have your glycogen repleted for competition. Uh, certainly any weight sport athlete that, that does a lot of weight reduction. And then bodybuilders, um, you know, everybody tries to micromanage stuff during peak week. One of the things you really can make a meaningful uh, impact on is whether your, your muscles are full of glycogen or flat and depleted. So the purpose of this uh, semi-meta-analysis, it was more, more a systematic review, um, the purpose was to look at the extent of muscle glycogen depletion through different modes of exercise and then also to look at different uh, dietary approaches for replenishment uh, of depleted glycogen. One of the reasons I wanted to talk about this was because I thought the terminology was hilarious. So they, uh, you know, normally you'll see in a study, they'll be like, we call this effect size trivial and this effect size small and this effect size moderate. Well, they put in the huge category, which I had never seen. Maybe that's a standard thing. I mean, I do supplement research, so small is enormous. And moderate doesn't happen when, when you're talking supplements. So <laughs> I'm not used to these huge effect sizes. Maybe that's a thing. But uh, turns out when you do a very specific glycogen depletion protocol, the effect size on muscle glycogen levels is technically huge. 
<laughs> um, so that there was no surprise there. But what they did look at was some of the characteristics of the studies that caused really big depletion of muscle glycogen. So if you're out there and you're thinking, I want to deplete my muscle glycogen, either because I'm trying to super compensate for competition or because I'm just trying to shed glycogen weight um, or whatever the case may be, your reason for depletion, or if you're doing exercise like this and you're wondering, will this make me depleted? That's another way to look at it. Usually longer duration stuff and uh, bouts that include both low and fairly high intensity work in the middle those were the ones that really depleted muscle glycogen. So usually the ones that were over 60 minutes total and had some really heavy duty, high intensity kind of spurts within those 60 minutes. So if you'd think you'd go on a bike at like a normal kind of low to moderate steady state pace, have a few bouts mixed in where you really grind it for a little bit and, and then kind of recover on a, on a lower intensity uh uh, you know, a little stretch of lower intensity kind of going back and forth. That That's pretty much what you're looking at. The, the challenge with glycogen depletion is you need the duration of the, of the bout to be long enough to actually get the job done and burn through some substrates. You know, if you think you're going to go and do a series of 10 second sprints, that ain't going to do it. You're, you're going to burn through a bunch of phosphocreatine. You're going to make a bunch of phosphocreatine. You're going to be going back and forth. Obviously you're going to, you're going to get some, some glycogen depletion in the process, but if you're trying to maximize your efficiency, you, you would do this kind of at least an hour just to make sure you're burning through that substrate with enough total work to get the job done. Um, now, on the replenishment side of thing, that, that's what I find to be most useful for most people that are listening. Um, they did look a little bit at single studies that were comparing types of carbs. So you can look at uh, complex versus simple carbohydrates so starch type car carbohydrates versus sugars uh, there's some studies looking at small molecular weight versus you know larger molecular weights there are some modest differences here and there with individual studies but really I, I don't think it makes a lot of sense to to get bogged down in those granular details um, I think the most important things you want to worry about when you're trying to to restore your glycogen is the timing of the carb refeed and the amount of the carb refeed. Yeah, so I'm I'm skeptical that the small me, small molecular size is slightly better. Uh, right. That's what you have here on this outline. Because I learned from T Nation that the key to recovery is the high molecular weight stuff, the mm -hmm. highly branched cyclic dextrin, uh, which is probably the most sciencey phrase I knew when I was like 17 only yeah. because of T Nation ads. So uh I am quite quite honestly shocked to hear that that's not the most scientifically rigorous uh supplement brand on the market. Yeah, you can find it little... If you can't trust BioTest, who can you trust? I don't know, man. You you can find these little individual studies that might indicate some of these granular details matter, but the really important factors like the molecular weight stuff, I'm just not that interested. Maybe I'm way off base here, but um, I mean, my lab, we, we did a, a study looking at carbohydrates of different molecular weights. It didn't matter at all. Um, what I think is most important, there is a post-workout window when we're talking about glycogen repletion. So a lot of times people have seen these studies about saying like, ah, post-workout window doesn't matter. Those are really looking at protein for the most part. Um, when we do exercise and we've got our muscles contracting, uh, the, GLUT4 translo uh, the GLUT4 transport proteins translocate uh, to the, uh, the outer region of the muscle so that they can help bring carbohydrate into the muscle and store it as glycogen. So that GLUT4 translocation... Um, that is a transient effect. It happens in response to exercise and then it goes away. So you really want to capitalize on that post-workout period. Uh, if your interest is in completely maximizing muscle glycogen replenishment also during this time, immediately post-workout, there's some additional blood flow to the muscle, um, kind of residual from the workout that might facilitate some of that nutrient delivery. So within the first two hours after a glycogen depleting workout, that that's a really good opportunity to make sure that you are, are, are getting that glycogen replenished, especially if it's time sensitive. 
if you do a depleting bout and you don't need to use that muscle group for another 48 hours, it doesn't matter. You really don't have to worry about it. But if you're, you know, doing this glycogen depleting exercise and you need to make sure that you're completely uh, repleted in terms of glycogen for a bout that's in 16 hours or 24 hours, then you might want to take a closer look at it. Um, now, the common approaches that they looked at uh, in the studies in this particular paper they would basically give a bolus of carbohydrate uh, every 30 minutes or 60 minutes or two hours. And generally speaking, there wasn't a huge difference between them. But I think one thing to keep in mind is that glucose and galactose use different intestinal transporters than fructose. And uh, so what that means is it probably makes sense to make sure that whatever carbs you're eating are going to be broken down and absorbed as a combination of glucose and galactose and fructose. Um, so glucose transport, it's, it's absorption uh, in the intestines. It maxes out around 60 grams per hour. Some people estimate it to be a little bit higher than that, but for the sake of argument, let's be conservative and say 60. Now, if instead of having a pure uh, glucose uh, bolus of carbohydrate, if you had a two to one ratio roughly of glucose to fructose, then you could probably get away with absorbing 90 grams of carbs per hour. So I, I think uh, the easiest recommendation would be shooting for somewhere in the ballpark of 60 to 90 grams of carbs per hour. You could have a bolus roughly each hour, or you can have a bolus twice as big every two hours. That should be enough to get the job done. And I think leaning toward a, a roughly two to one ratio of glucose to fructose makes a lot of sense. Um, and, and then certainly it, it can be a mixture of, of starches and sugars and, and all that stuff. But generally speaking, you want some degree of glucose, some degree of fructose, ideally somewhere near a two to one uh, ratio. Another fun fact about glycogen repletion is that caffeine can actually help a little bit. It's not going to make or break your glycogen load, but caffeine can be useful, which leads me to another paper recently that I'm not going to get too much too far into the details on this one, but um, did you have something to say about glycogen? I had something to say about BioTest. Okay, <laughs> what do you got? So, dude, I forgot how ridiculous this product was. So, if you're if you're old like us and you were on the internet when the Anaconda protocol dropped, that's what that's what all the memes were about. Just because, like. You can't tell me that that, that wasn't intentionally sexual. Uh, that that was one of the most ridiculous marketing campaigns ever. I forgot just how... I mean, whatever. Like, if they can get people to pay the price, like, market sets the rates, whatever. I get that. But I forgot just how much of a ripoff plasma was. So that's where... That's where they were talking about the benefits of highly branched cyclic dextrin all the time. So Trex, just tell me, what would you pay for a uh, reactive, a reactive pump activator, a brutal workout formula, if you will, um, which per serving has uh, 38 grams of carbs, 15 grams of protein, a little citrulline malate, and a little betaine? Um... I mean, 75 cents per serving, maybe a dollar. How does 70 bucks for 20 servings sound? That's higher than I'd... About, about two and a half offered. bucks per serving. Yeah, that's a little above what I was putting on the table. That's outrageous. I spe yeah, I mean, how much is a little citrulline? I don't know, dirt cheap. I mean... The, no, I mean, what, what's the dose, did it say? <laughs> it's in a proprietary blend, so it's ah. not listed. That's how they get you. So, yeah. So you know it's not much. I mean, the the proprietary blend includes the protein and carbohydrate. So that that's where can I math? That's where that's fifty three grams of a sixty five gram total formula. Um, so I mean, like some of the some of the things here at the end, like magnesium citrate tribasic, sodium. Like, there's probably not that much of that. So it, it might be appropriately dosed citrulline malate and betaine, even though I am still skeptical because it is a proprietary formula. Um, but I mean, just the fact that 
you know, it's 65 grams per serving and close to two thirds of that is carbohydrate and it's two and a half bucks a serving. That's wild. Yeah. Well, you know, it's a stand up company. These are good people. So we don't want to disparage their name or their product. I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's terrific. Sure. 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 Perfect. Okay. Now I had a really good segue and you, you just stomped all over it with this insertion coffee (laughs) coffee yeah there you go um so like i was saying (laughs) after after reading so much biotest sales copy boy am i tired i could do with a (laughs) stiff cup of joe take it away (laughs) perfect thank you um so there's a a recent paper by pickering and gergic the title is is coffee a useful source of caffeine pre-exercise and uh, basically what they what they concluded, I'm jumping right to the highlights here. They said there's limited evidence that caffeinated coffee has the potential to offer ergogenic effects similar to those of caffeine anhydrous, which is basically just supplemental caffeine. Um, at first I read that and I thought they were saying like that there's a lack of evidence. I think what, what they're getting at is there is some evidence, but it'd be great if there were more. There aren't that many studies looking at coffee specifically as an ergogenic aid, but uh, what we have would indicate that it is pretty equivalent uh, in terms of its ergogenic effects. Um, and what they also noted was that co-ingesting caffeine with decaffeinated coffee. So if for some reason a person in the world were inclined to have decaf coffee and mix some caffeine into it, um, the decaffeinated coffee does not detract from the ergogenic effect of the caffeine. Now, the only reason I bring this up, we've talked about caffeine plenty on the podcast. The reason I bring it up is nerds like Greg will always talk about, you know, it's just a single study. Let's wait and make sure it gets replicated and all that stuff, right? Single study, you don't want to get too carried away. This is a perfect example. So in 1998, Graham et al., did a study and they tested several different treatments. It was a placebo, uh, a caffeine capsule alone, regular coffee with caffeine in it, just a normal cup of coffee, decaf coffee. And then the final treatment was decaf coffee with a caffeine capsule. Okay. Um, All of the treatments aside from the placebo, obviously, uh, and the decaf coffee, provided 4.45 milligrams per kilogram of caffeine. It's a pretty standard uh, ergogenic caffeine dose. The only group out of all of those that improved uh, was water plus a caffeine capsule. So the regular coffee didn't work and the decaf with the caffeine capsule also didn't work. Um, And so what they theorized was that something in the coffee was inhibiting the beneficial effects of caffeine and they, they thought maybe it was the chlorogenic acids. But I mean, with coffee, it's like, take your pick. There's like hundreds of bioactive compounds in it. We essentially ran with that conclusion for like 15 years to the, to the point that as late as like 2010 in review papers, they would say like, yeah, if you want to get an ergogenic effect, it can't be from coffee. You got to get the good stuff, the caffeine anhydrous. So this is like a, a real world example of where for I think about 15 years, we took this one study and said, well, looks fine to me and just went with it. Um, and then it wasn't really until 2013 that a few studies started reinvestigating that question and it kind of just went the other direction. You know, there, there's still, we could certainly use more uh, data related to this particular question, but from what we have in the last few years, there have been more studies coming out. There's one by Hodgson et al. There's one by Richardson and Clark. My lab group did a paper on the topic. And generally speaking, what we find with some of this more recent research is that caffeinated coffee seems to be just fine in comparison to a caffeine supplement, which intuitively makes sense, but is actually uh, a controversial take, or at least it was up until about a couple years ago. So this is a, a real world world example of uh, when people like Greg want to be a stick in the mud and they say, hold, hold your horses. Let's see if that actually replicates. This is an example of that. However, I, I will uh, note that um, Pickering and Gergic in this paper, they bring up some good points. There are some challenges with coffee. 
If you're using coffee and trying to get ergogenic doses of caffeine, sometimes that requires you to ingest a pretty high volume of fluid. Um, so for some people that might be annoying pre-workout having a bunch of coffee. Obviously, you can go to some uh, you know more concentrated coffee type products with higher caffeine content. But uh, another thing to keep in mind is variability of caffeine content. So the type of bean, how it's roasted, how finely it's ground, how it's prepared, all of these things go into the actual caffeine content of the coffee you're drinking. So if you're trying to get an exact ergogenic dose for a really big competition, that's something to keep in mind. Um, and a great example of that is a study by McCusker et al. They got the same product from a coffee shop six days in a row. So same product, same location. It was Starbucks, right? I believe so, yeah. yeah. And uh, of those six days, the lowest caffeine content of this product was 259 milligrams, and the highest was 564. So um, that's a hell of a range. I mean, th those are two very different experiences from that cup of coffee, right? So um, it's something to keep in mind if you're going to use uh, coffee as a regular ergogenic aid. I do. You know, I think it's fine. Uh, but if you're like, let's say it's day one of the Olympic trials and you're trying to make sure you've got your, your caffeine dose perfectly titrated, then it might make sense to go with something else. Um, brand new study that is not super relevant, but I found it fascinating. This came out like a week or two ago by Fukuda. Um, the title is Habitual Coffee Drinkers uh, May Present Conditioned Responses from Coffee Q. And this was a study in, I believe it was in the field of psychology. This isn't like a performance fitness type thing, but I found it interesting. The sight and smell of coffee alone, they didn't ingest any of it. it they basically were just like, okay, smell it. You see it? Here's some coffee. Take it away. Uh, that alone appeared to enhance performance on a simple reaction time task in habitual coffee drinkers. So it was one of those things where um, if you believe that your love for coffee has gotten to the point where simply being in its presence is a positive thing for you, uh, apparently these people got a, a benefit from just smelling and seeing it. All right. And there was one more study that I wanted to talk about. Uh, so the title of which is which specific modes of exercise training are most effective for treating low back pain? Network meta-analysis by Owen et al. Uh, and so essentially what, what this was doing is looking to see what sort of interventions and therapies helped with various things associated with low back pain, and then also which therapies were more or less effective. So uh, they looked at things like what most helps with pain, what most improves physical function, uh, and what most improves mental health. Um, because people with chronic pain conditions often find themselves in a, a pretty dark uh, mental place as well. Um, and so that's what they were trying to do, not just to see if these things work, but which things work better than others. And so as far as pain goes, uh, Pilates actually was the runaway number one. Um, so they, they did some statistics like based on the results of the meta-analysis to see what the odds were that each particular treatment was the most effective and least effective. So I'm going to go down. And so like that has to do with both the effect size estimate and also the variability. So for example, something, if there's two treatments and one has a slightly larger effect size, but it, it's more highly variable, it may have a slightly lower, it may, it may have slightly lower odds of uh, being the best treatment than something with a slightly lower mean effect size, but much smaller variability. So I, I'm doing this by likelihood of something being the best, not just what had the largest effect size. So it, it it's kind of like a, a dual measure of effect size and uh, consistency of the effect. So as far as uh, pain goes, Pilates seemed to be the runaway number one most effective thing. It was like a 68% chance or so that it was the best therapy of the ones included in this meta-analysis. Uh, other ones that did quite well were uh, aerobic exercise, and uh, so that was number two. And then roughly tied for third were stabilization exercises and resistance exercise. Moving on to physical function, 
The most effective was resistance training followed by stabilization exercise and water-based exercise roughly tied for second place uh, with yoga in, I guess, fourth place because there was a two-way tie for second. Uh, And then aerobic exercise and Pilates were also quite effective for physical function as well. And from a mental health perspective, the most effective seemed to be resistance training followed closely by aerobic training with Pilates in a somewhat distant third. Um, So things just to mention about this is uh, (laughs) the type of exercise that most people would do. um, Like when most people think, oh, I'm going to go work out. They're either thinking I'm going to go lift some weights or I'm going to go for a run. Like those seem to be the most common types of like quote unquote workouts that people do. Um, And aerobic exercise and resistance exercise were both among the most effective treatments for pain, physical function, and mental health. So, you know, if you're dealing with low back pain and you're thinking, should I go to the gym and do some sort of gym thing? The answer is probably yes. Um, Pilates also seemed to do quite well. Uh, It showed up on all three also. So, you know, I mean... I'm biased. I was about to say, so like if your mom or dad is dealing with low back pain and they're like, oh, should I do Pilates? Say sure. But I mean, if you're dealing with low back pain and you're thinking, should I do Pilates? Sure. Like that's all, that also seems to be a very, very good option. Um, But yeah, so kind of depending on what you're interested in, uh, resistance training maybe is the most robust. It seems to improve both physical function and mental health the most. Pilates seems to be much, much more for just like pain itself. But really, I would say those three have the most support. But, and I think this is the most important thing, just get moving. Um, So again, those were kind of ranked by odds of being the best therapy of all of the ones included in the meta-analysis. But you can pull up the full text of this and look at the effect sizes. The effect sizes for all three of of those outcomes, uh, pain, physical function, and mental health for virtually all of the exercise types were large effects. So we're talking really anywhere between like a Cohen's D of 0.7, which is like a moderate effect, but close to a large effect up to about like 1.3, 1.4. So like really meaty effect sizes for all of the outcomes for all of the various types of exercise. Uh, so really you can't go wrong. It's you're, you're choosing, It's like, are you choosing the best of a lot of good options? It's not like these are good options and the rest are shit. Uh, But so anything that got people moving was great. However, all of the controlled conditions weren't that good. So with, with low back pain or really any type of pain, generally it tends to improve over time. You're just dealing with regret, uh, regression to the mean, but in terms of how the control conditions worked, either if it's a, true control, a passive control, which is like, you know, just getting advice from a physical therapist who doesn't actually lay hands on you. Or, and I think this is the most important one, uh, hands-on control conditions in these studies. So that would include stuff like manual therapy or chiropractic, which a lot of people do go towards for treatment of low back pain. Uh, Those things weren't nearly as effective as any kind of exercise. So this is something that's pretty important because a lot of times when people are in pain, they develop kinesophobia, like they just stop moving. Um, And I mean, there are probably not advisable ways to move if you're dealing with low back pain. Like if you find that, say, max triples on the deadlift tend to aggravate your back and you're dealing with low back pain, you should get out and move, but maybe don't pull max triples, you know. Um, but kind of within reason you get moving and that tends to help things a lot. Uh, stuff like manual therapy and chiropractic, maybe it's better than nothing, but that's not much of an endorsement. The, the effect size is there just massively paled in comparison to any type of exercise. Um, so I think that's the biggest takeaway. Uh, you know, like maybe if the biggest issue with your low back pain is just the pain itself, yeah, go for Pilates. Maybe if, you know, the biggest problems it's causing you are decrements in physical function or decrements in mental health, 
yeah, maybe go for resistance training, but for the most part, just get moving and that's gonna, that's gonna make things better. And don't try to rely on just manual therapy and chiropractic to fix it. It's probably not going to be nearly as effective as exercise would be. Let me ask you a quick follow-up for that. You mentioned that for all of the exercise interventions, the effect sizes were pretty, pretty big. Were any of them scientifically considered huge? No, they weren't. Mm. Um, so g- giving you uh, an actual answer to a joke question, um, <laughs> l- like I said, they were all pretty much in like the 0.7 to 1.4 range. That's, that's pretty good. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, I think that does it for today's episode. I believe we've fatigued the audience. We've outstayed our welcome. This is probably time to wrap it up. Uh, to play us out, I do want to remind the listeners that we have our biggest sale of the year going on. The uh, the big Black Friday sale for Mass is going on November 25th uh, to December 2nd. And remember, the a huge percentage of the proceeds of that sale go to the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Uh, really, really good charity. Um, they get 100% of the profit from the new subscribers we get during the sale, along with 50% of the profit from current subscribers. Uh, so it's a great time to get a good a good price on a mass subscription. And uh, you can uh, feel good about knowing that a big proportion of that is going to charity. So that does it for today's episode. We've got... Uh, on the other side of the music, we've got an interview with Ben Pollock. Uh, we talked to him about power building, basically the, the fusion of powerlifting and bodybuilding for people who are in, who have both you know lofty physique goals and lofty powerlifting goals. Uh, we also talked about physical culture, a little bit of a, a change of pace for for our podcast. But Ben did his PhD studying physical culture and. Uh, talks to us all about specifically the history of physical culture it was a really really interesting conversation so we hope you'll enjoy it as always thanks for listening and we'll talk to you next week Welcome back to the Stronger by Science podcast. Today, we have a special treat. We are joined by Ben Pollock. Ben, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. So, Ben, uh, for any of our listeners who are not already familiar with you and your work, do you mind giving us a, a brief description of who you are and what you do? Sure. I uh, who, who am I? I guess that's a tough question, but I... I am a physical culture historian and professional powerlifter, I guess you could say. I've kind of forged my own path. And, you know, currently what I do is compete in both powerlifting and bodybuilding now. And I coach some athletes. I do a lot of social media writing and other types of content. And on the side, I also do some academic work related to the history of physical culture, which encompasses not just strength sports, but really anything that people do to make themselves more fit or more capable of performing in athletic events or even in their daily lives. Yeah, and and you did your PhD in uh, in a physical culture program at the University of Texas, right? Correct. Um, are, are, is there any analogous program to that? Whenever I think physical culture, that's the one that comes to mind. Are, are there other programs like it across the country? There are, but they're pretty few and far between. It's a rather niche program, uh, as you can imagine. And the selection of schools that you have to study that sort of thing is rather limited. Are Are you still doing your research at Texas, or have you branched out on your own at this point? I branched out on my own. I, well, My fiance and I recently moved to Virginia. Actually, it's been a full year now. And so I'm no longer at Texas at all, although I do hope to return at one point. Yeah. And so, Ben, on on the powerlifting side of things, uh, it seems like you uh, write a lot for Elite FTS. Is that right? Yeah, I write for actually a lot of sites. Elite FTS, uh, Barbend I also write for. I've done a little little bit of stuff for Kabuki Strength. Some other, you know, one-off stuff. I think Garage Gym I did something for and similar sites like that. So I really enjoy the writing process and I've, I've been pretty prolific in that area. Awesome. So I would imagine a lot of our listeners have read your, your writing before, and if they haven't, uh, hopefully they'll check it out after this episode. So, 
Um, today, obviously, because of your background, we certainly want to talk a lot about physical culture because um, you have a very unique perspective on that, um, given how much you have studied it. Uh, but before we do that, you mentioned that you compete in both powerlifting and bodybuilding. So uh, you're, you're one of those few people that really embraces that hybrid position where you do a little bit of both. Do, do you see yourself as basically 50-50 or are you more of a powerlifter or more of a bodybuilder? Yeah, not even close to 50-50. It's more like 90-10. I, uh, I don't really enjoy bodybuilding at all, uh, but I do you know, seem to be able to stay lean fairly easily. And over the course of my powerlifting career, I've added enough muscle mass that I can do decently in, in bodybuilding with a, a little bit of work for the areas that are neglected with typical powerlifting training. But uh, you know, it was really the the reason I stepped into bodybuilding in the first place was to give me my body a break from, you know, the strain of the heavy weights, my body and my mind. So the the first time you dieted, were you surprised by how much it sucks getting like stage lean? Eh, not until like the last three weeks. And honestly, I think I over dieted for that point. I think, you know, had I stopped three weeks out and just started maintaining, I would have looked a lot better on stage. Yeah, I, I've definitely been there. It's the thing is, if you're a relatively intense person or a very focused person, it's so easy to fall into that of like, well, I'm already here. I might as well just push and push and push. Um, given that you do a little bit of both, you've got some powerlifting and some bodybuilding. Um, how do you generally set up a power building program? I mean, I would imagine just because of what you've accomplished on both sides of that spectrum, a lot of people come to you saying, I, I want to do the same thing. I want to have a strong squat bench and deadlift, but I also want to look like a bodybuilder. How do you begin putting together a program like that for somebody? You're right. I do get a lot of people asking that question and it's really challenging for me because, you know, I spent probably the first, God, I started training in 2000, 2005, maybe 2001. And so for the first decade of training, I was only focused on the squat bench and deadlift and added a lot of strength to those movements. So then when it comes time to add in the accessory work that's going to build up the points that don't get a lot of work from those, which are typically, you know, stuff like the extremities, calves, arms, shoulders, that sort of thing, you can add it in without really interfering with your training because you've already built that solid base. But I get so many people asking, you know, they just want to jump in without having that base and it's virtually impossible. And so I really, really push them hard to just focus on powerlifting until they have a sufficient level of strength to really support the muscle mass that they need in order to reach those goals. Uh, you know, when I'm programming for myself, it's much different, again, because I don't need a lot of work for muscles that, for the bigger muscles, right? A lot of hypertrophy focused work. So I can afford to build my program around the main lifts and variations of the main lifts. And then I'll add in, you know, currently I have a, a couple extra days uh, for my shoulders and arms where really I'm doing mostly band work sets of, you know, 50 or 100 reps, just trying to get some blood through that muscle uh, to really focus on building the muscle volume, but not really concerned about strength at all. So you basically kind of view it in stages where, where you bring somebody in who has both these goals and you say, well, well, let's just kind of focus on the powerlifting side for a while and build a base in the pro in the, the process. And then we'll start working on refining some of the details associated with bodybuilding. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's really, really hard to convince people of that really hard. Um, but I very strongly believe that. So, I mean, about how long of a buy-in do you do you typically ask of people? Cause, cause I could imagine people are, are quite impatient with that. Um, yeah. And it really depends on the individual, you know, because some people do have a very good strength base built already. And then, you know, maybe you need a, a couple months of polishing up technique. Other people who are raw beginners might need five years of focusing purely on strength until they have that base built. So it's extraordinarily individual. It's almost completely individual. Um, but at the same time, you know, typically what I tell people is, okay, give the strength thing three months because I think three months is kind of the minimum you need to see, you need to put in to, in order to see decent strength gains. And a lot of times what happens is people will start training that way. They'll find it's really enjoyable. They find the, they're seeing progress almost on a day-to-day -day basis and they'll kind of, it'll be easier to convince them, okay, let's stick on this route for a little bit longer. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm just curious here. Do you know of... Uh, of many other people who've kind of taken the same route through powerlifting and then bodybuilding that you have? Because just right off the top of my head, I can think of several people who were like fairly successful bodybuilders uh, or at least like 
you know, did hypertrophy focused training for a long time, got super jacked, and then tried to transition to powerlifting and did quite well. Um, but I, I can't think of that many people right off the top of my head who, you know, started on the powerlifting side of things and then went on to be successful in bodybuilding. That very well is probably just blindness on my part because I don't follow bodybuilding that closely. So like once someone slips out of powerlifting and gets into the bodybuilding world, they just kind of fall off my radar. Um, but can, can you think of any other people just right off the top of my head who have been successful taking the same route you have? I mean, it really depends on what you mean by powerlifting. People love to claim that, you know, Ronnie Coleman was the ultimate power builder because he did a few powerlifting meets, but that was never really his, you know, main focus, right? And so it's really hard to say, okay, how many elite powerlifters have done this? Um, and off the top of my head, I don't know a whole lot. I think, honestly, I think if you're going to train to be that high of a level of powerlifter, it can be, for, you know, at least for me, it was pretty mentally exhausting thinking, okay, now I essentially have to start from scratch learning an entirely new sport where, yeah, maybe I have a little bit of leg up from the 15 plus years I put into this, but it's a little bit compared to these other guys who, you know, whether they've just been genetically gifted or they've been training in a different style for longer or whatever the case may be, uh, you know, they're way ahead of me relatively. No, that, that makes a ton of sense. So you, you think it's more, you, there aren't that many people who've been successful going the direction you have mostly just for for psychological reasons more so than like physical reasons yeah and i don't have a lot of data to support that but that's kind of my opinion from from the people that i've talked to and from my own experience um and again i think you mentioned this but the other way around it's much different you know you start off with bodybuilding i think picking up powerlifting is maybe a little bit easier um but i i haven't had that perspective so i can't say for sure no i i gotcha that that makes that makes a ton of sense i just hadn't really heard that perspective before but i mean now now that you explain it it makes all the sense in the world i wonder if uh you guys know uh johnny jackson used to train with branch warren a lot did he yeah. start in powerlifting because i know he used to uh hit the big three pretty hard i i believe he did i'm not sure though yeah i'm not really sure either um, I think his best deadlift was something like 800, which is a great deadlift, but at 275, again, it's not really elite level. So, Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. So you've competed in both. It's not just like, hey, I'd like to be kind of good at both. I mean, you've, you've competed in powerlifting, competed in bodybuilding. And so as you approach one competition, you know, whether it's a powerlifting one or a bodybuilding one, do you start to shift your training to be basically just pure powerlifting or pure bodybuilding or do you continue to train as if it's kind of a hybrid thing even when competitions approach it depends on how close you are to the competition i think you know for powerlifting it's definitely beneficial to keep some of the hyper the, some of the higher rep work i don't want to say hypertrophy focused work but some of the higher rep work in even in the later stages of prep because it's very important to focus on that balance you know for me if i'm not training my outer quads. Well, I know my knees are going to start hurting because I have a tendency, I have flat feet and I have a tendency to let my uh, VMO take over. And so if I'm not specifically addressing that muscle group, well, it's going to, it's going to lead to problems. Um, the opposite is also true. I think, uh, you know, I think in bodybuilding, if you're dropping all of your heavy movements, as soon as you start prep, I think you're probably going to lose too much size dieting. Again, I don't have nearly as much experience in the bodybuilding world, and I can't say that for sure, but that was kind of my impression. And I wish that I had trained a little bit heavier during prep and not dieted so hard, to be honest with you. But again, in the very late stages of either, you know, say you're three to four weeks out of a meet or a show, I do think you have to focus exclusively on one or the other. Yeah, I mean, at a certain point, you, there's just that need for specialization, you know, in that, you know, that last month, maybe six weeks leading in. Now, one of the interesting things about people who do both bodybuilding and powerlifting, um, in full disclosure, I have competed in both, but I was a, a bodybuilder who did powerlifting to stay busy, basically. Um, so kind of the inverse of, of your perspective. But lately in the field of exercise science, there's been, um, there's been a couple kind of like opinion papers out that have argued that essentially the change in muscle mass over one's lifting career is not correlated with 
the change in strength over that career or more specifically over the context of maybe uh, a study you know a, a, a few months of training that the change in muscle size is not related to the change in strength as someone who has you know been involved with both hypertrophy training and powerlifting what's your take on that general concept um, you know, I'm probably going to defer to this answer quite a bit throughout the interview, but I think it's entirely individual personally. And I hope you guys don't take offense to this, but even coming from an academic background, I put almost zero weight on academic studies because I know how sloppily designed, how poorly executed and how limited their applications can be in the real world. And so I, <laughs> it, it really kills me when somebody, you know, says that something doesn't work because they read a paper that said the contrary. And in this case, you know, you mentioned within the scope of a study, you know, it didn't make a big difference. But if you have a guy who's training for three months, he's not going to make that much progress no matter what compared to a guy who's been training for 30 years. And so I do think there are certainly individuals who, you know, can add a ton of muscle mass without ever training heavy. And the opposite is true too, right? You can add a ton of strength without ever adding a lot of muscle but i think for the vast majority of people they're going to be pretty correlated yeah i mean that that's the thing that kills me as well like strength can change pretty substantially in a few months especially if you're working with untrained lifters but like muscle size even even if you're dealing with completely untrained folks like th there may be some some visual changes in how much muscle someone has on their frame but if you're talking like you know, how many actual millimeters of quad thickness did they add? It's not that much. So you're, you're essentially dealing with really small changes that have a reasonably substantial degree of measurement error. And you're looking to see, like, does this, do these small changes in a noisy measurement correlate with something else? And I don't think it should shock anyone that sometimes the correlation is relatively poor. Like, just knowing the measurements and the magnitude of changes you're dealing with, it's shocking that the correlations are even weaker than they are, you know? Yes, absolutely. I totally agree. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I come from that world of, of carrying out, you know, exercise and nutrition studies in, in controlled lab, lab environments. And, you know, if I do a study and the results conflict with what, we observe day in and day out in the real world my first question is basically what's wrong with our measurement or our design it's not well clearly the whole world around me is crumbling but this study captured the real truth you know what i mean i feel like that's one of those things where if you have a particular study design or research paradigm that doesn't seem to be reflecting what everyone is observing in the trenches it's probably more important to reflect about what might be flawed in the paradigm rather than is it possible that everything I thought I understood about muscle and strength was wrong. So it's kind of that, that same thing that, that you said of like, there's a lot of these studies with, with severe limitations that people often take it in isolation and treat it as an undeniable fact. When in reality, there's, there's, there's quite a bit of nuance to, uh, to suss out with any particular study or or even collection of studies. Now let's let's bring it back to the trenches. Um, one of the things I thought was cool when, when I first started messing around with powerlifting after doing years of bodybuilding was um, powerlifting taught me a little bit that I could take back to my bodybuilding training in the future. I thought powerlifting in a way made me a better bodybuilder. Um, what do you think? is something that most bodybuilders would benefit from adopting uh, when it comes to how powerlifters train. I think the level of effort that you're putting into the training is far, far, far greater in powerlifting. I really do. Even having gone through a pretty intense prep, uh, you know, it's hard to push yourself when you're dieting very, very hard. And in those cases, I can see, you know, the chances of injury go up, your fatigue level is so high. Sure, you're not going to train all out then. But I see <laughs> almost every bodybuilder in my gym, they train like that year round. And I think when you're in the off season and you're rested and you're fresh and you're getting plenty of calories in, if you're not training heavy, you're doing yourself a major disservice, a major disservice. And most 
bodybuilders, you know, think they can train the same year round and, and make progress. And maybe they can make progress, but I think they would make far greater progress if they actually learned how to train hard and heavy um, when appropriate. Going harder, going heavier. Now, now, what about the inverse? Do, do you think there's anything that powerlifters can stand to gain, uh, it, it borrowing some concepts or some lessons from from bodybuilder training? Yeah, it's almost it's almost exactly the same. But you know, sometimes you'll have powerlifters who start dieting when they know they need to make weight for a show, and they just eat like total crap the rest of the year. And it's just like, why? I, it doesn't make sense to me. You're giving up so much. Uh, potential recovery, you know, health benefits, muscular. Um, sorry, I got, I'm I'm kind of uh, fired up now, and so my my words aren't coming to me. But um, your body composition could be so much better, and all it takes is you know not eating junk day in and day out. But I think a lot of powerlifters think, oh well, you know, I don't have to look pretty, and so they almost use it as an excuse to eat like crap. So so basically bodybuilders should be training more like power lifters and power lifters should be eating more like bodybuilders. That's my, if I had to pick two, you know, overarching themes, those would definitely be the case. Those would definitely be the two ones. Um, now, obviously you can get into a lot of nuance here. I mean, for example, uh, you know, if you're saying, okay, you got to train hard and heavy if you're a bodybuilder in the off season, well maybe, but maybe you're not going to benefit that much from doing heavy squats or heavy deadlifts, depending on what the case may be. Um, you know, what your goals are, what your strength levels are, how your body responds. And, you know, maybe you're a power lifter who, you know, focus, does eat clean, but, you know, you focus only on a squat bench deadlift and you would really be uh, benefited by doing some isolation work for certain muscle groups. I mentioned my outer quads and how much I've benefited just from training those, which was shocking to me. But the ability to uh, activate those muscle groups has really made a big difference in my compound lifts. So th this is very out of left field, but I'm genuinely curious. What uh, what do you do to specifically train your outer quads? So as someone who doesn't have flat feet, I kind of feel like if I do quad work, it just trains all of my quads kind of similarly. Uh, and, and I've heard about people, t I've heard people talk about isolating certain heads of their quads certain ways. And I feel like I've tried everything and everything just feels like just normal quad work. So I, I'm curious what you do to target your outer quads. So for me, it's mostly dealing with foot position and I like to use machines so that I can really focus on the movement. Uh, I'm excuse, excuse me on the muscle and on the movement, because if I'm doing squats, I can cue that in my head and I can get a little bit in there, but it, it's pretty hard because you've got to focus on st stabilizing the weight and moving the weight. Whereas if I'm on a leg press, well, it's like I can use a super controlled negative and I can make sure that I'm keeping my foot position perfect where I've got my feet pretty wide for me, right? And if you've seen me squat, you know I squat pretty darn narrow. Um, so pretty wide for me. I've also got my toes pointed pretty far in and I'm really trying to spread the platform, which again, you know, those are typical cues that you would use in a squat. But for me, those really left a lot out um, because, you know, I honestly think because of the flat foot, maybe the weak adductors um, and that led to knee pain for me for that kept me out of the US Open last year. So um, for me, that's what works again. So. I'm such a big proponent of individuality in both sports that I hesitate to make any blanket recommendations. Um, for me, it's much easier to work with somebody in person so I can see what their movement patterns look like and how they might need to change those to target different muscle groups. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. I, I mean, I, I, I wasn't looking for like a general recommendation for VL training. I, I was just genuinely curious because that's not something I've ever personally experienced. Um, so, so just building off those prior two questions that Trek, that Trex asked, um, you know, what powerlifters could learn from bodybuilders and what bodybuilders could learn from powerlifters as, as someone with kind of a foot in both communities, what are some just general misconceptions you see on both sides of the aisle? Like what are things that you see a lot of bodybuilders believing about powerlifters that just aren't true? And conversely, what are some misconceptions that, powerlifters have about bodybuilders? Well, you know, for the biggest misconception I had about bodybuilders before I started competing was that they were all kind of, uh, I hate to use this word, but prima donnas, I guess. Would be, 
stereotype <laughs> where you know there's a lot of rivalry and they're not there's no real sense of community and it's everybody wants to one up the other guy and at my experience at both shows that I did completely untrue. Everyone was super supportive. Everybody is kind of in the same boat suffering together. And so there's a lot, a lot of support that you get from the community and bodybuilding. It's really, really awesome. Um, so that was my personal biggest misconception. The other was that bodybuilding is pretty easy. And I do think in off season, if you train like a typical bodybuilder, it's pretty darn easy. Um, but I think if you train hard and you diet hard when you're dieting, bodybuilding is pretty darn hard, just as hard as powerlifting. Um, from the flip side, it's, you know, it's really hard for me to, to say, um, because I started out as a powerlifter. My background is entirely in strength. And so I just don't have the perspective. Um, if I had to guess, it'd be that all powerlifters are fat. And, you know, nowadays, you know, that's not true. There's a lot more competition in the lower weight classes. I mean, you can look at Yuri Belkin, who, you know, as we're recording this, he's going to be competing in big dogs tomorrow against some of the hugest guys. And Yuri is relatively slim for, for somebody putting up those types of numbers. I feel like Yuri is just trolling everyone. Like, <laughs> d- dude goes 242 at every meet and weighs like 224. Like, what the fuck, Yuri? Just cut to 220. Stop making everyone else feel bad. I've heard he moved all the way up to like 228 to this. Uh, oh, shit. <laughs> He, he's bulking yeah, hard. hard. Yeah. Jesus Christ. He's a monster. He is. All right, Ben. So we've picked your brain about training a little bit. Um, now we want to talk to you about the other aspect here, which is the physical culture. So we, we mentioned earlier that uh, you did your PhD studying physical culture. So I guess the first question is, why pursue physical culture uh, as an academic pursuit? Why, why is that important? To you. Actually, if, if I could interject just something more basic than that, I, I feel like physical culture isn't a term that's used as often as it used to be. So just just so all of the listeners are on the same page here, how would you define physical culture first off? Um, so personally, when I define physical culture, I tell people exercise. Um, that's kind of a, not a great definition by any means. If you were to get an academic definition, you know, I believe, uh, don't quote me on this, but I believe what my advisor and her husband, Janet Terry Todd, came up with was that physical culture is any sort of purposeful activity that people do to improve their lives or their academic performance. And I think the important thing to remember there is pur- purposeful, right? It's not walking the dog. Uh, it's something that you're doing specifically to make yourself more fit to feel better in your daily life or to perform better at your, your chosen sport, but it's also separate from sport, right? So it's not, you know, basketball wouldn't be considered physical culture. Um, that gets kind of tricky when you then talk about, well, is powerlifting a sport, is bodybuilding a sport, because those generally do fall under the umbrella of physical culture. And when you get in academia, the arguments about definitions of certain terms can go on and on and on. And I don't like to get into that sort of nuance, but uh, that, that would be my best kind of summary at a high level. Makes sense to me. Yeah, and um, now that we've got a working definition, why pursue it as an academic pursuit? Why is it important to you? Uh, I really fell into it, man. So I was uh, was working at Google when I applied to go to school at Texas, and I had got my undergrad degree in finance and information technology from the University of Virginia, and I worked for a few years and finally landed this job at Google, and I'd always wanted to work there because I'm a bit of a nerd. and I, You know, you see all the, the – you read the articles and you see the movies and you think it's just this dream place to work. So I get there and I find out I'm not all that happy there and I need to, you know, need a change of pace. And so I'd always planned to go to business school, and so I was looking at different programs, and the universe – and you know, I was training at the time. I started training in high school for wrestling. And so sport was a passion of mine. And I thought, you know, maybe I could combine some of these things, get into sport in some way, but still use the management skills that I had from my, my undergrad degree and hopefully from my MBA. And so Texas has a very good kinesiology program in general, including their MBA with a focus on sports studies. And so while I was browsing the Texas website, I found my future advisor's biography, Jan Todd. And if you guys don't know about her, she was uh, the world's strongest woman. She was one of the very first uh, female powerlifters ever. She has hundreds and hundreds of accolades in fitness. She runs the Arnold Strongman Classic. 
every year in March in Ohio. And so she's very, very active in the industry. And I found her biography and I was like, wow, I want to work with this person. So I call her up and I tell her, hey, you know, I'm, I'm applying to the MBA program. I was hoping if I get in that I can do some research with you on the side. Well, Jan has a very strong personality. And so Jan basically said, you know, forget the MBA. Just come work for me. <laughs> I, I, I didn't appeal to me at first. You know, I had this plan and she just slowly coaxed me along the way. She was like, well, you know, why don't you submit your resume just so we have them file in case you change your mind? So I do that. And she's like, well, you know, why don't you take the uh, – the GREs, just so we have your scores in case. I was like, yeah, sure, it's no big deal. It doesn't cost much. And so I do that. And she's like, well, you know, I think we could probably get you some scholarships for fun. And so she just kind of, you know, pushes gently, gently, gently until finally I buy in. And once I do, I realize it's it's absolutely the right fit for me because it's really doing what I love, not what, uh, you know, I thought I was going to make money at or thought, you know, I was supposed to do that sort of thing. So ju- just out of curiosity, if you, you know, if you weren't Ben Pollock and a world-class power lifter and Instagram famous and a prolific writer, how does one, uh, how does one apply a physical culture degree just out of curiosity? Uh, you teach other people to study physical culture. <laughs> <laughs> So now that we kind of have uh, the groundwork laid, why study physical culture? What is it in the first place? Um, Kind of going all the way back, what are some of the roots of physical culture in the West, which is probably what would uh, apply to most of the people listening to this? And then what are some like major physical culture traditions elsewhere in the world that are, you know, maybe really cool, but most listeners wouldn't be aware of? So the first, the answer to the first question I think is pretty cool because the roots of physical culture in the West are very deeply tied to religion. And so actually if you trace the, trace the history of it, in America at least, you know, there was a strong tradition of Puritanism right when the country was founded or right when the first settlers came over. And in the Puritan culture, you know, the body was considered almost ungodly because if you were too concerned about your outward appearance, you weren't focused enough on your spiritual life, or at least that's, you know, how their logic went. Well, sometime in the mid 1800s, there came a new movement called muscular Christianity. And this actually started over in Europe. But the idea was that, you know, actually, we have it backwards. God gave you this body. And if you're really trying to worship God to the utmost, you're going to do as much and take care of your body as much as you possibly can. And so this idea of muscular Christianity really led to people, um, well, led to males, at least, focusing more on different aspects of sport and different aspects of improving their bodies as a way of kind of showing their uh, religious spirit. And so if you're really, really tracing the roots back, that's that's where it all kind of starts. And that's obviously a very, very rough, uh, rough sketch, and I would never <laughs> explain it like that in an academic talk. But I think that if you're trying to get the broad overview, that's really uh, more or less how it, how it started. And then from there – you know, you can get a lot into how technology and media influence its growth. And if I were to pick two, you know, umbrella areas, those would be the ones that really um, brought physical culture into the mainstream. So do, do you see that as like the foundation of modern physical culture in a way that's like discontinuous with, say, ancient Greece? Like, do, do you think that there was kind of a split such that it would be improper to trace the roots, you know, all the way back into the BC era. Yeah, it's 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 contentious, right? I mean, there are obviously a lot of traditions that began with the ancient Greeks and Romans that you know still are practiced today, and then there's a lot that's not. I mean, the Olympics is the obvious example, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but then you had arc divide between the ancient Olympics and the modern Olympics, which began in 1896 and or 1892, actually. I think. Um, and so it, it's 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 difficult. Again, academics really love to argue these nuances, and I am it just they, the nuances don't interest me. So I might not be the best person to ask from that perspective. But yeah, I I personally would would look at it more as an outgrowth of that muscular Christianity movement, and then uh, changes in technology and technology and the media around the turn of the century. Uh, for me, there those are kind of more relevant factors. Well, I mean, you're the only person with any 
academic qualifications in the history of physical culture on this podcast right now. So regardless of what the other people say uh, in the context of this podcast, anything you say on the subject, I'm perfectly fine just taking your word for it. That's one of the nice things about studying a really niche topic is that, you know, unless you're going to a conference about that topic, you're probably the only one who has any idea what you're talking about. So you could make <laughs> stuff up and nobody would know the difference. Yeah, I mean, that that makes sense. I uh, I should have thought of that. Yeah, so quick follow-up question for me. Um, ben, you, you had mentioned that the, uh, the muscular Christianity movement w- was it pretty much exclusively male. Um, what was the, when, when did the tide turn and, and when did women kind of, uh, enter the fray in terms of physical culture in the West? Well, you can certainly find examples of females who trained, uh, under what would be called physical culture practices in as early, as early as the late 19th century. But I think, you know, you look at modern, uh, women's sport and it's far far different than uh, women's sport was at that time and I'm honestly not an expert in that area and so I'm really hesitant to, to make that make any claims along that um, but the number of you got to remember that even even when this muscular Christianity movement was going on the people who trained exclusively for the definition of physical culture that I gave earlier was, was it was pretty niche and women were even more rare in that arena. You know, you look at early gyms, you look at gyms dating all the way back to the mid 20th century, and, and oftentimes women weren't even allowed in them. Uh, and so, you know, there's obviously a lot of uh, issues regarding gender inequality that go into that and, and other societal factors that take it much, much more broad than physical culture itself. All right. So j- just kind of looping back to the second part of my question. So that's the roots of physical culture in the West. What other physical t- culture traditions are there out there or have there been out there that, you know, our listeners in the U.S., Canada, Europe might not be aware of? Uh, man, there's a lot. There's a whole lot. I think the, the most important one to call out would kind of be the Turner Turner movement, the German Turner movement, because that was also very influential in the growth of physical culture in the West. Um, and that was essentially, uh, if I were to draw, uh, uh, an, a poor analogy, it would be something like, you know, talk P90X or other popular exercise program, uh, that, was focused mainly on gymnastics, calisthenics, that sort of resisted, ex- uh, that sort of exercise that wasn't strictly using resistance, although they did occasionally use light dumbbells and things like that. Um, but that was a big practice that was brought over to the United States and largely um, remained in German immigrant communities and, and became integrated into larger physical culture practices. And that was pretty important in the evolution of physical culture itself in America. Uh other practices I think are cool, you know, you can, and actually Jan and, and Rogue have done some, some really cool videos on these, but you can look at the stone lifting that was done in some of the Icelandic countries and some, uh, some areas of Spain. You can look at, uh, the wrestling that was done in India and other areas in the East. Um, and, oh boy, <laughs> there's, there's actually... There's a whole, whole lot of different things that you can go into. Um, you know, the history of yoga is very fascinating. All those sorts of things to me are really, really cool, but it, it gets so broad because physical culture itself is such a broad topic that you could spend years studying any one of these. And Ben, you did spend years uh, studying one particular topic, or at least you, you obviously anyone doing a PhD selects a, a topic for a dissertation project. And you did yours on Jack LaLanne, right? Uh, yeah, Jack LaLanne. So why him? So originally, well, yeah, originally my focus was specifically on physical culture and entrepreneurship in the 20th century and 20th century America. So I was looking at guys who practice physical culture on their own and really turn that into uh, a business for themselves or for their clients or, or for other people or for whatever. And originally, my plan for the dissertation was to do a study on the spread of uh, 
unique gymnasiums throughout the country because if you look at that spread, it's really, 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 really interesting. It begins on the East Coast, obviously, um, because that's where you know most of the early settlers were in the, the history of the country, but then uh, moves over to the West Coast, to California, and then spreads following post-World War II, where many of the soldiers who were stationed in the West then went back to their homes and were able to tell other people about the gyms they had trained at California. So the geographic spread is really, really interesting. But right when I was about to begin my dissertation, uh, Jan was approached by Jack Lane's widow, Elaine Lane, who wanted to make a donation of some information uh, of Jack's letters and research and that sort of thing to the Stark Center. And there was a whole, whole, whole lot of information. We're talking boxes and boxes and boxes of letters, of newspaper clippings, of uh, different promotional and business-related materials. So just a wealth of information that was all going to be available at the Stark Center. And Jack, in particular, was an extraordinarily influential figure in both the history of uh, fitness in America and also in the history of you know, fitness entrepreneurship. Uh, and fitness celebrity. And so it was really a very natural topic. It was a, a pretty impactful topic that would reach a broader audience than my a, uh, my planned study. And so that's why I decided to go with it. It was really lucky. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad you brought up fitness celebrity because I, I feel like a lot of people today have never even heard of Jack LaLanne. Uh, actually, first, I'd just like to comment that Elaine LaLanne is like Bob Loblaw levels of <laughs> legendary naming. Um, but yeah, so my grandmother was a huge Jack LaLanne fan, um, like had pictures of him clipped out from magazines, talked about the glory days when he had, as I understand it, a nationally syndicated TV show. Um, so like, how did he get that famous? And like, like, obviously there's big Jack people who have also gotten famous and are still famous for example arnold schwarzenegger but as i understand it jack lalane had a tv program where he told people about working out and like did workouts and a bunch of people tuned in so like how how did that happen and why do you think that hasn't been replicated um because to a very large extent he was lucky he was in the right place at the right time gotcha specifically he was in california when the tv industry began um, so if you look at the history of television specifically, it started out, well, you know, the television was invented much earlier, but really people, the growth of television access exploded after World War II, exploded, just astronomical rates. And so all of a sudden there was this need for programming, right? Because you had gone from almost nobody has a TV to virtually everyone has a TV in the span of a decade. And so you need programming to fill all that time. And so... They were looking for different types of shows, and Jack did have a, a certain charisma that he could really project and make himself very affable to, to viewers, even without ever interacting with them one-on-one -on -one or in person, and that certainly helped him out a lot. But just the fact that Elaine had a history of radio broadcasting, so she was already uh, hooked into that kind of culture, and the fact that he was in California, where you know Los Angeles in particular was the hotbed of, of television programming, at the time and so he had the he had this specific knowledge right because again physical culture is still a niche thing it's growing very quickly because all the soldiers who had been in world war ii were telling you know their friends and their family back home about all these cool things they saw when they were stationed in california um you know there's a reason we we look at muscle beach in california and see that as you know the, the birthplace of bodybuilding even though it's really not and so he had knowledge about this topic he had a very um pleasant way of conveying it to to viewers that people wanted to watch and then he was in the right place at the right time and so you know putting all those three together is very very difficult um to plan it's not something that you can you know really say oh you know i'm gonna be the first person to start a tv show about uh fitness if there's already a hundred different ones of them and then on the same token you know if they're none at all coming up with that idea is not something that a lot of people are going to do. So that that was that confluence of factors really helped him. I gotcha. So I, I actually have at least one more question on Jack LaLanne, but I, I want to uh, pull out one of the things you just said because uh, I found it interesting. You said that a lot of people think Muscle Beach is kind of the the home of bodybuilding where it got started, but that's not the case. 
So I was laboring under the assumption here that that was in fact true. Uh, so where actually is like the birthplace of bodybuilding and how did it then like migrate to Muscle Beach and, and why do people think that Muscle Beach is where it all got started? Um, so I think actually this is one area where most physical culture academics would agree that bodybuilding started with Eugene Sandow, uh, okay. who was a performing strongman, but also had an incredible physique and he would travel through, uh, different circuses and give demonstrations of strength, but also show off his body. And that really inspired then Bernard McFadden, who saw him at the world's fair in Chicago, uh, started, inspired Bar- Bernard McFadden to write a magazine about physical culture, uh, and actually develop a publishing empire from it. And, you know, sponsor actual bodybuilding competitions, although they're very different than the bodybuilding competitions we see today. So that's really where it started. I think the reason that so many people associate it with Muscle Beach is, again, because of the media industry and not television this time, but the movies. And so if you're going to trace that back, you, you know, there's actually an author who calls the 1940s the age of the chest because that was the time when you first saw men not fully clothed in the movies and you know one some, several of the actors who were very popular at the time had really well developed pecs and and that was seen as very attractive and then when you have the all the bodybuilders that come to Muscle Beach to train there um you know whether it's because of the war whether it's because of other factors uh, all, those things compound the the situation or the the growth rather and so then you start seeing these bodybuilders starring in movies like steve reeves and hercules and and that really captures the mainstream attention whereas again sandow and mcfadden were even though they were very very prolific they still weren't i I wouldn't at least consider them mainstream i gotcha So, so if i can uh kind of go down this rabbit hole a little bit further before looping back to jack Lalane. Another thing you just mentioned is that the early bodybuilding competitions were, you know, much different than what we see now. What were they like? Um, you know, they would, first of all, uh, the level of leanness was nowhere near what it is today. The level of muscularity was nowhere near where it was today. Um, there was a greater focus, I think, on muscular control and posing um, and fluidity. And there were also athletic components of it. There were often times where you would have to uh, perform certain lifts or that sort of thing. And then finally, the judging was not exactly, uh, not exactly, well, even today, the judging is almost completely subjective, but uh, I would say it was even more so then. I gotcha. Um, So kind of looping back to Jack LaLanne, one of the, one of the things we get asked about a lot is to um, like talk more about uh, how how fitness evolves and how lifting should change uh, and and just kind of what people should expect with the aging process if they try to stay strong and active. Um, I'm not 100% sure about the demographics of our podcast audience, but I know that our website audience, um, you know, skews older than the average fitness site. Uh, So a lot of people ask us about that. And one of the things I know about Jack is he maintained incredible physical shape as he got older. And one of the things he was kind of famous for was performing feats of athletic prowess when he turned like 60, 65, 70 years old. Um, And I don't remember the details of any of them. Do you know some of those just right off the top of your head to kind of maybe dazzle our our middle-aged and older listeners? I think his most popular one was the escape from Alcatraz, right? Where he's on Alcatraz Island handcuffed and he swims back to the mainland, uh, handcuffed the entire way. And, uh, you know, it's, it wasn't really an escape from Alcatraz. He didn't break out of the jail, but to make that swim, it is treacherous water in, in that the currents are very, very strong. And on top of that, it's freezing cold. Um, you know, so to perform that feat was, was pretty darn impressive. Let, let alone you're swimming handcuffed and it's over a mile. Um, I believe the the total length was something like 1.4 miles when you accounted for the for the current. So that was pretty uh, pretty ridiculous. The other one that was really popular was uh, towing boats. Again, handcuffed and swimming. Uh, he chose swimming in particular because he had hurt his knee playing football in high school, and so he was unable to run. And so swimming was something that was you know kind of an endurance sport that could also show off his strength when he was tugging the boats or whatever. And 
so and it was uh, something so outlandish that it really caught mainstream media attention. Do you remember just right off the top of your head how old he was when he did each of those things? He actually did most of them twice. He did them uh, both, the, and it was almost always to celebrate a birthday, or he claimed it was. Sometimes he did them after. It wasn't always on his birthday, but he started out in his 40s and performed most of the stunts and then repeated them in his 60s to show that he had maintained that level of fitness. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> I've got a follow-up question about Jack um, because so Greg, you mentioned that your grandmother, I think was, was a big fan and uh, my grandfather was as well. And the question I have is, did he have when, when he was, you know, at his peak popularity with the TV show and everything else, did he have rivals or peers that were anywhere on like a similar tier or was he just kind of a essentially a one-man fitness industry he absolutely did uh you know one that i've written quite extensively about is debbie drake who was obviously a woman um but her show was extraordinarily popular mainly because she would perform the exercises in what was then considered pretty provocative clothing and so she would have the women watching because the women wanted to look like her and she was she would have the men watching because the men wanted to watch a woman dress like that contorting herself on the floor um so she was very very popular um then later when you get into the 1980s and remember Jack's show is syndicated so it's still being broadcast then you have people like Jane Fonda um, so you can really the he was by no means the only person in the space. There were a lot of other people as well um, who were lesser, who were not as well known um, and who also practiced different forms of physical culture. So, for example, uh, uh, yoga was one that had several TV shows about, um, you know, how to perform yoga and introduce yoga to a Western audience. Uh, and there were some. Some shows with military background, actually, or roots in the military, where they would show calisthenics that were performed by the military for, for general fitness. Um, in the 1950s, national fitness became kind of a bigger mainstream concern, not only because of the media, because, but because of the whole Cold War. And there was the idea that we had to be fit as a nation to fight communism. And so there were several, several opportunities for other people to enter that space. What uh, what current country do you think we should start another Cold War with to get people uh, interested in physical culture and getting jacked again, just out of curiosity? Uh, if, if, if you had to orchestrate a geopol geopolitical conflict, uh, who, who you got? It would absolutely be Russia again. I want to see a battle of the giant plates and see how thick we can get our deadlift plates, how much we can make that bar bend. Um, because, you know, you look at the, uh, uh, what is it? The WRPC, um, and how they use the thicker plates in the, in their championships. And I would love to see that over here. I, I think that's a good call. I mean, we beat them once we can do it again. Absolutely. I wouldn't discount the Netherlands though. I feel like they're a good option too. <laughs> I would like to jump in here and just say that I will have the opportunity to, Go to the Netherlands next year. I'm going to meet my coach, Mike Descher, and I'm going to be giving a talk at the National Museum for Photography there about powerlifting and bodybuilding, how they kind of relate to the media. So I'm pretty excited about that. I, I was actually going to ask you about that because I saw that on your Instagram. Uh, and I was just, go, just going to kind of put it out there uh, to ask if maybe I could give you an undefined substance to attempt to slip in their water supply surreptitiously. Uh, but we yeah. can, we can talk about that once we're done recording. We'll do that offline. Okay. So, is is there anything else that you think is really really cool about Jack Lalane that most people don't know that they should know? Um, what the the coolest thing I always thought was how he uh, he trained for his swims or for his mental strength. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I think a lot of those feats of endurance that he did were more mentally demanding than physically demanding in some ways. And so the, the extremes that he went to practice for them, like he would sit in a bathtub and just have a lane pour ice over him again and again and again, just sit there for hours so that the cold wouldn't bother him. Uh, things like that to me were, were the most impressive by far. That makes sense. So Ben, you mentioned some pretty incredible feats, athletic feats uh, that Jack accomplished. 
but obviously you've got a very uh deep understanding of the history of physical culture do you have like a favorite lifter or a favorite lifting achievement that most people have never heard about um you know i'm not really sure it's hard for me to say because it's hard for me to have perspective on what lifting was like back in those times um but if i had to pick one I think Bob Peoples, who was the first person to pull a 700-pound deadlift at 181, I think that was a really, really cool story. He was trained by my advisor's husband, Terry Todd, and he actually had a very unique style of deadlifting where he would deadlift with a very, very rounded back and was still able to lock out enormous amounts of weights. And Terry also trained Lamar Gant, who had scoliosis, bad scoliosis, and pulled the same way. And, and Terry still claimed until his death, that Lamar Gant was the most impressive lifter of all time for the feats that he was able to perform at such low, low body weights. So those guys would definitely uh, definitely be up there. Is it controversial to suggest that Lamar Gant is the best power lifter of all time? I think that it probably is and it shouldn't be. I think he gets overlooked because he lifted in smaller weight classes. You know, People want to see the biggest guys lifting the biggest weights possible. And I think that's a shame because I do think it's pretty cool how... Uh, um, smaller guys are able to lift enormous weights. But at the same time, now that I am trying to add on muscle mass, I see that it doesn't help you as much as you might think. Like adding 30 pounds to your lifts, well, adding 30 pounds to your body weight won't necessarily make your lifts go up 100. Um, so I, I have appreciation for both sides. Um, but yeah, I do, I do wish the smaller lifters got more recognition. So, so, so just out of curiosity, uh, why Lamar Gant instead of someone like Hideki Inaba or like in more modern times, uh, Fedosinko or Oleg? Oh, I guess you didn't. I thought I were thinking you were thinking somebody I studied specifically and I didn't, I, you know, I was pretty focused on American lifters. No, fair, fair enough. Um, who, who, who do you personally think, um, is super impressive that maybe no one has heard about? Cause I, I assume most of our lifters, are going to, or mo most of our listeners are going to be at least somewhat familiar with Lamar Gant. So who's, who's kind of like either a, a super, super old school physical culturist or like a more obscure lifter, um, who's done something that you find super impressive that, that more people should know about. Yeah. I mean, I, I would still defer to Bob Peoples there. Um, you know, Sandow is definitely somebody to study, he actually, many, many people have studied Sandow and the feats that he performed were pretty cool. But again, back before formal records were recorded, you could really make up what the amounts that you were lifting and nobody would able to call, be able to call you out on them. So I, I always take those older guys with a grain of salt. Fair enough. All right. So moving on to somewhat new territory, I, I guess we have uh, touched on this a little bit. And it, it's a question we talked about before we started recording and you said very understandably that there's no way you could get into all of it. Um, but just in general, how have opinions on strength training uh, changed over time? And how has media portrayal of strength training and being big and muscular changed over time? Because it, it seems like back in the day, it used to be something that was cool. And then kind of cardio and aerobics had a, had a big day in the sun in the 80s and 90s. And you know, now there's more superhero movies, more interest in resistance training again, it seems. So like, how have those opinions shifted? And what seem to be some of the factors driving those shifts over time? Yeah, so I think we've already covered, you know, kind of the origins of physical culture and then how it spread following World War II. I think you can really look at the media following World War II and see a lot of really very interesting ways that uh, popular culture have, has influenced strength training. Uh, one, my very favorite example is the advent of superheroes and particularly uh, Superman and uh, the Superman comics because you look at Superman in the 1940s and 50s and he looks almost like a normal guy and then you look at Superman today and he looks like you know he would put Kai Greene to shame mm -hmm. and that coincided with the that, that change in how Superman was portrayed coincided with the uh, proliferation of anabolic steroids. So that I think is something that's very, very interesting to look at. And also, uh, you know, when you look at the way that health and fitness have been kind of conflated with each other, uh, 
I think that is almost entirely driven by the media because you have images of, and this, this you can trace back very, very far, but you have images in magazines and TV shows of whether it's a professional bodybuilder, whether it's a fitness model, um, whatever the case may be, of, hey, this person looks beautiful, therefore they are healthy. And when in reality, you know, what that person did to look that way was probably very unhealthy. And I, I would contribute that almost entirely to the media. Um, when you look at strength training in particular, I think, again, the superhero thing was pretty big. I think that uh, Arnold and the guys that I mentioned in the movies were very, very big in that. Uh, and so I could go on for a very, very long time. Um, I think you specifically mentioned uh, the cardio boom. That, though, was more driven by uh, fears of health, actual concerns over health. Um, when President... Uh, I should really know this off the top of my head. Um, I want to say President Eisenhower had a heart attack uh, on a golf course that really raised fears of this silent killer that uh, men in the United States were unfit because they had too much stress in their lives. They didn't have enough physical activity. And that really coincided with some of the space programs, some of the other things that people needed to be fit for. And so all of that kind of gave rise to, to aerobics, to running, and to that, that um, area of physical culture. And so, again, I could, it, it, it's an extraordinarily difficult question because, again, you could spend a lifetime studying this stuff. Uh, and so hopefully those few examples are kind of interesting for people who want to look them up on their own. Um, but to dive into even any one of them, you could write a whole dissertation on. That makes sense. I think that kind of comes to an end of the pre-prepared questions we had. Did you have anything left to ask, Trex? No, I will say when uh, when when you said a fear of health uh, about that cardio boom, I thought you said a fear of hell, yeah. and I thought this was going to circle all the way back around to muscular Christianity. Yeah. I was on the edge of my seat, man. I like that. That could be in my alternative history, my alternative dissertation. We, we are all sinners in the hands of an angry God, but if you can maintain a six-minute mile pace, uh, you can escape that hand. I'm going to hell. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, that was the way my ear heard it. I was like, I can't wait to see where this goes. I'm so intrigued. <laughs> I, I feel like we could write physical culture fanfic about it. I think that's already been done, right? I, I don't know. I will admit to be to being fully out of the loop when it comes to uh, lifting-related fanfic. I'm sure there's a community for it. Um, so, Ben, we, we want to stay respectful of your time. You've been here for, for over an hour at this point. Um, is there anything you would like to leave the listeners with just in terms of closing thoughts? You know, I, I don't know that I want to leave the listeners with this, but I do want to thank you guys for the information you put out. I think one of the things that really gets to me in the fitness industry is how much terrible information there is. And so what you guys are doing with the website, with the podcast, with Mass, I really, really appreciate it. I think that you are making the industry better for everyone, um, You know, regardless of how that knowledge is used. The fact that you're putting out good stuff is very, very important to me. So I wanted to thank you all for that. Well, that that honestly means a lot. Uh, you're, you're one of a, a relatively small handful of people in the industry who I feel incredibly confident pointing people towards knowing that you will also uh purvey good information their way so that that honestly does mean a whole lot coming from you and ben he doesn't say that to every guest so that, <laughs> no special. no like two prior guests have have tried to feed me that line and it's just like cool thanks <laughs> um <laughs> just kidding maybe uh so all right just kind of in closing where can people find you uh, how can people connect with you and your media empire? Probably the best, easiest way is just Instagram. My my name is PH Deadlift on there. That's probably the easiest way to find me. My, I've tried to use that pretty consistently so that it's it's easy to find. You can uh, check out my website at phdeadlift.com. And if you have questions, you can email me at ben at phdeadlift.com. So it's all pretty pretty straightforward. Um. And, you know, I'm, I'm happy to do my best to help. Like I said, most of this stuff is individual. So, you know, broad questions are kind of difficult to answer, but uh, I'll do my best. Sweet. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me, guys. I really appreciate it. 
Thanks for listening to the Stronger by Science podcast. Now, Greg and I are not experts in medicine or health or really anything else for that matter. So before you make any changes to your diet and exercise habits, make sure you check with a doctor or another healthcare professional. If you enjoyed this podcast and you'd like to support it, visit strongerbyscience.com to check out the products and services that we offer. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.